Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first thank the uh, President and the Secretary of the Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists for having this wonderful session and also inviting me to be a part of this session. And uh, <coughs> uh, next half an hour, I'm going to talk to you. Actually, I'm going to give an introduction to you uh, about uh, obesity and how you think about obesity, whether, whether you should think about the normal, ordinary way of obesity or whether you have, you have to change your mind to think about a newer way of thinking about obesity. Uh, because uh, there are specialist uh, people who are interested in obesity, like, uh, you know, the, they will talk about medical management, surgical management, and Professor Kalapuhana is an expert on uh, obesity. We have worked with him for a longer period of time. He will talk about uh, uh, nutrition, then exercise specialists will talk about that. And then there is a, actually a good part of this session is that everybody in this session is interested in obesity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, all of you know that uh, today, is, today is the World Obesity Day and the theme for the World Obesity Day is everybody needs to uh, act together. And uh, why is this? Actually, you probably will think that obesity management needs a multidisciplinary teamwork, but that is not only the issue here, not only the medical part of it. If you want to deal with obesity, you need to in engage in other, a lot of other areas. Into the education is very important, even higher education sector is so important, then uh, sports important, then your environment is important, then food industry is important, planning <coughs> planning and economics, everything is important if you want to deal with obesity in a successful manner because unless it's not going to work together. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in my talk I'm going to give a, a brief introduction to the obesity, then overview of uh, the, how the control of appetite is happening and obesity related morbidity and mortality and few management options and few conclusions. All of you know that if you look at the prehistorical breed uh, 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 areas, if you look at this, you know that animals are animals will never suffer from either from obesity or anorexia nosa because our if you look at the trifrigine hypothesis, uh, if they are, we are actually effectively for the energy storage, so you can live longer without any any energy, uh, getting any energy. Therefore, we have changed this side, side of uh, uh, approach with time. You all know that uh, the progression of mankind, you know, last uh, 2.5 million years happened uh, gradually, but uh, last 50 years we have changed our environment into a, into a more uh, you know, comfortable environment for all of you and causing this uh, huge epidemic of obesity which we are dealing today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's important to just think about what is obesity first and I'm sure that uh, this uh, audience uh, needs no introduction to obesity but obesity is the abnormal uh, excess fat accumulation in the body and for you to say that excess fat you should know what is normal fat in the body. So men who is having more than 25% of fat and women who are having more than 33% of fat we defined as obesity and uh, and majority of the time we are going for surgical options we actually accurately look at the fat content of the body because sometimes you can go wrong with the muscle content when you have high BMI. So the BMI is just a practical way of uh, measuring obesity and it's always uh, easily can relate to the, mo uh, the morbidity and mortality as well as other complications. Therefore, it's a good um, uh, way of measuring obesity. Ladies and gentlemen, just to show you the BMI classification in, in, uh, in Europeans as well as Asians and uh, just, just to, uh, you know, stress on the, uh, the European uh, 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 cutoffs, you understand that usually you all know the 25 to 30 as uh, overweight and then from 30 you start obesity grade 1, grade 2 and grade 3. But the uh, more important thing here is that higher the BMI, the higher the risk of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality. And if you look at the Europeans and the Americans, they have uh, about two or three years ago published another article showing that with the BMI they are going to have a, have a risk, uh, the morbidity and mortality risk uh, uh, calculation by using a complication of diabetes. We have one complication of diabetes, mild, two complications, moderate, three complications, severe risk of obesity. So dealing with obesity, especially looking at the risk of obesity causing other complications. So Europeans and Americans, they use the, the complications of obesity as a risk of measuring the risk of obesity. And it's good for them because, uh, because it's more, uh, 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 actually if you look at the data, it's more associated with the, with the complications. But when you look at the 
combat the obesity risk in the Asians, it's slightly different. And because uh, we have a central obesity more than anybody else as South Asians, therefore it's always better for us to add the BMI, uh, add the, the waist circumference into the BMI when you look at the, look at the risk of obesity. When you have a same BMI with a normal uh, waist circumference, has a low risk of uh, obesity, and when you increase the waist circumference with the same BMI, you have a higher risk of uh, uh, obesity. So I think it's a, uh, it's a always better for us to look at. That's why we actually, for Asians, we always say it's it's nice to look at your face from the mirror, but look at the whole body from the mirror. Then you get a uh, get an image of your whole body that will stimulate you to do more exercise and 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 maintain your weight. So what is BMI, ladies and gentlemen? BMI is a cutoff of a mortality cutoff. That's very important to understand. Now, if you look at the BMI, when it is increasing more than 25, actually mortality increases. And uh, so BMI cutoff has taken from the mortality, mortality data. If you look at this New England Journal data, especially here, you look at the, this corner, uh, you have the, uh, have the males and the other corner you have the females, you will understand whenever there is an increase uh, in BMI, there's a huge increase in mortality when you go more than 25 of BMI. What that means is that when you have obesity like diabetes, you are going to have lose some years in your life because this causes uh, increased morbidity and mortality. Therefore, we know what is diabetes. We know that uh, diabetes cutoffs are how the cutoffs have been taken. Further, if I just uh, uh, tell you how it happens. Now, if you look at a cohort of patients who are having 70 years of age with a, with a higher BMI, like 40 to 50, uh, actually about 40% 40, 40 of people will live uh, at 70 years of age. But when you have the same age, 35 to 40 uh, BMI, 60% of pe people will live at that age. And when you have a lower BMI, about 80% of live at the age of 70 years. So that's what the mortality data shows us. Therefore, we have to be very clear that uh, uh, the, the obesity increases the mortality. This actually uh, uh, stimulates people to look at whether obesity is just a condition or just another disease which can give rise to most of other complications. Therefore, if, therefore they look at whether it's a disease or not. So that's how uh, obesity became a disease when the abnormal fat, uh, excess fat accumulation in the body which have a bad impact on your health, which, which is a definition of a, of a disease. Therefore, with the mortality data, people thought that obesity is a disease, and we define now obesity as a disease. And if you look at loads of data, loads of articles are there to say that obesity is a, it's a disease. Just I want to show one Lancet article on diabetes and endocrinology, which suggests that officially it's a primarily a, a disease which causes symptoms and signs and complications. And before this publication in 2017, 10 years before, the US declared obesity as a disease. Therefore, this is not the first time, even about 10 years before, uh, the US declared obesity as a disease. If it's a disease, ladies and gentlemen, it should have clinical features. What are the clinical features of obesity? It's a hunger and lack of satiety. We talk to an obese patient, patient comes and says, Doctor, I'm very hungry all the time. I'm unable to stop eating. So that's the, that's the symptom of obesity. And they say, I'm unable to control that. Why? It's a subcortical level control. You are unable to control eating because it's a subcortical level where you are unable to control. That's why it, it causes as a disease and, and it also causes complications like diabetes, mechanical issues, cancers and so on. So, Diab the obesity is just like uh, diabetes or any other condition. So obesity is a disease, not only a disease, it's a chronic disease, and it's also a chronic progressive disease. So therefore, you need to understand this very clearly. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, just don't think obesity is just a simple thing. We always think that you just eat something and you do exercise. So eating, you take energy, you just uh, energy output by doing exercise. So it's so simple. So when you get an obese patient, you say that, don't do too much of uh, eating and just do exercise. It's your, your uh, un unsatisfactory behavior. But it's not only that. Loads of other organs are involved in the obesity. Not only the brain, the gut, adipose tissue, pancreas, everything is involved in the obesity. And, uh, and so it's not a simple thing. It's a very complex thing. Not only that, genetics are also in involved and the environment is also involved. 
So whatever these causes, the environment, genetics, and complex uh, uh, regulation of uh, this uh, energy, finally what causes is uh, excess energy uh, uh, input into your body, which causes obesity, but it's not that as simple as that. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have to just think about how this regulation happens. And if you're going to be with me, I hope that you will understand this very clearly. The brain is the main uh, regulatory uh, organ in the, in the uh, energy metabolism and causes obesity, especially the hypothalamus and the midbrain. And the stomach and the small intestine is playing a major role and, uh, when you eat, and also the pancreas cause a major role, and also the adipose tissue. If you look at the meal-related afferent signals are coming from the stomach, when you eat, the ghrelin will stimulate your appetite, therefore you start eating. And there are certain other things like polypeptide Y, GLP-1, CK, CCK, which inhibit your appetite. Therefore, you will see, I, I'm okay, I'm, your satiety feeling will get by this. These are all meal-related afferents where, which, which uh, occurs uh, when you eat. And then what will happen with time? Uh, the pancreas gives insulin, which inhibits this, inhibit your appetite. Actually, you will see that there is this opposite of it, but that will give more, more and more insulin. It's properly, if you have the insulin, actually inhibit. And adipose tissue gives you leptin and inhibits your appetite. So there are long-term efferents come from the adipose tissue as well as pancreas inhibiting your appetite. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, when you do a bariatric surgery, you are reversing all of these. And you know, all of this will be reversed. And the next day of the bariatric surgery, patient say, I'm not hungry, doctor, I'm very happy. Patient is not eating, but very happy. Because we have stopped this, all these mediators coming out of the gut. And there's a new medication is produced uh, in this, uh, uh, causing all this together. In another two, three years time, we'll get the me medical med medicine out. With all these inputs, there are efferents happen. It, it either appetite increases, at the same time energy expenditure, you get, uh, you get very lethargic feeling of doing exercise because of the mediators coming out from that. Therefore, the pa patient come and say, Doctor, I'm unable to do exercise, I'm very lethargic. But we say, do exercises, don't worry about it. At the same time, you know, when you are aging, your appetite goes down, you get sarcopenia and so on. So age has an impact. At the same time, gender has impact. You know that the majority of the females uh, have, a, have a obesity, therefore gender-related uh, obesity, and also the menopause cause it because with the menopause you are getting an estrogen progesterone difference. With the more progesterone, will have a more appetite, in the inducing appetite, which causes obesity in the perimenopausal region. Therefore, we need to understand all this if you want to deal obesity properly. At the same time, rewarding stimulus when you try to feed the child at the early stage. You know, mothers will try to show anything and try to feed the child. What happens is you are stimulating your hypothalamus and child will start eating, unable to stop it later. So that's the rewarding stimulus that you are giving to the child at the early stage. Therefore, you are having an irreversible problem with time to come. Sleep, all of you know, eight hours of six to eight hours of sleep will have a healthy life. With that, ladies and gentlemen, short uh, course of it is not a complicated slide. If you look at it, you know, just trying to uh, make it simple. Central regulator uh, is the hypothalamus and the brain stem. And if you look at, uh, there are oxygenic peptides which stimulate your appetite, it's directly uh, 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 affecting the hypothalamus and brain. And also, there are some anorexigenic peptides working onto the, onto the brain, which causes your satiety. So these are the two things which, which act through the MPK pathway, if you want to know this uh, more. And there are some visceral efferents coming from your adipose tissue, pancreas, and the stomach and the GI tract, which I have shown. Then some of them, like ghrelin, has a stimulatory effect on your, your appetite, and others, like insulin, GLP-1, leptin, CCK, and polypeptide Y, has, a, has an inhibitory effect on your, on your appetite. So that causes whether you eat more or not. And then the efferent pathway starts from the other side of it. Whether to eat more, whether food is available, you eat more. Energy expenditure, whether you do exercise or not. And this peripheral metabolism as well. So this is the, actually the usual way of you know, uh, the energy uh, uh, metabolism which causes obesity. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a simple mechanism. This is a very complex issue. And therefore, don't think that the patients are wrong and blame the patients. This complex mechanism involving all these things will, will cause obesity. 
therefore few words about at least if you can photograph this uh, this and remember and some uh, certain things are incre increasing your satiety like serotonin insulin leptin cck and polypeptide y you know these are the interested areas of the uh, drug drugs that are developing at the moment and then uh, at least ghrelin which has a stimulatory effect of your of your appetite so the new drugs are coming up on these everywhere my colleague will talk how these drugs are acting in the different places in the obesity ladies and gentlemen obesity not only causes this regulatory mechanism changes obesity associated causes hypothalamic astrogliosis is, which is irre irreversible initially and later on it's irreversible so th there is a change in the uh, chain in the cells in the hypothalamus because of the obesity which causes irreversible effects with time to come and if you look at the high fat feeding uh, feeding rapidly induces hypothalamic inflammation and and glial cell activation so this is a huge uh, process of inflammation that you are triggering and if you have a diet induced obesity induces the brain inflammation and hypothalamic astrocytosis. So there is a, a pathophysiological changes happening in your brain uh, when, you, uh, when, when you get obesity, not only in the brain, when you look at the, look at the adipose tissue, there is a local inflammation response happening in the adipose tissue, changing the adipose tissue in a different way that you will never be able to reduce your weight with time to come. So adipose tissue, which has a huge change in the adipose tissue, with, with changing your obesity. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, there are inflammatory links between obesity and metabolic disease. Uh, you know already that the, how the brain affects the astrocy astrocyte uh, inflammation and then the, how, the, how the liver causes uh, you know, fat deposition. Not only at muscle causes, there is a lipid deposition in the fat and also the blood vessels, there is a fat deposition and pancreatic uh, cell death happens when there is a uh, fat deposition, inflammation happens in the pancreas. Therefore, these all happen due to the obesity which causes irreversible effects. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, just to show you that um, obesity causes, uh, causes uh, uh, so many complications, starting from dementia, stroke, diabetes and everything. I'm, I'm sure that all of you know this, therefore I'm not going to go great detail into this. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but if you look at association of B complications and the BMI, with same complicated, like hypertension, higher the BMI, higher the ch chance of getting hypertension, higher the BMI, higher the chance of getting a ischemic heart disease. Uh, higher the BMI, higher the chance of getting diabetes. So, think about this. You know, it's you can if you can intervene somewhere, that's the best way of overcoming this. And if you look at the obesity and ischemic heart disease, higher the BMI, higher the ischemic heart disease risk. If you look at every increase in BMI by four, there's about 25% increase in the ischemic heart disease. So it almost like diabetes, or actually worse than diabetes. If you look at this data, you know, if you compare this data with that. And if you look at the obesity and the stroke risk, either you are having hypertension or not, obesity causes increased stroke risk. If you look at this, whether you have hypertension or not, you have increased risk of uh, stroke risk, which increases this. Look at the cancer risk of obesity. Ladies and gentlemen, you can compare this with us tobacco smoking. We have, everybody is talking about, right? And everybody knows uh, tobacco smoking uh, is bad because it actually has higher risk of cancers. But when you compare with the green and the green and the blue, there's no big difference. There's about 20% chance of getting a cancer if you are an obese patient when you are compared with a non-obese individual. So that's the risk that we are looking at when you have obesity. Obesity and nephild, there's, there's a huge increase in, uh, in, in nephild when you have uh, obesity. And ladies and gentlemen, when you start acting for obesity, reducing weight in patients, majority of these uh, complications come down. And that's the nice way of looking at it and more positive way of looking at it. So, obesity, do you want to get into the normal BMI is the issue. When you have a 35 BMI, are you going to get to normal? When you have more than 100 kilo woman, are you going to get into zero figure? No. Answer is no, we can't do that. So we have to understand that. So just data showing achieving normal BMI. When you look at this graph, you will understand higher the BMI, you are unable to achieve the normal BMI. If you have a higher BMI or higher weight, you are unable to achieve a normal weight. Whenever you see a pain, that's the difference in clinical management of obesity. If you look at a 130 kilo woman, you are not going to get 100 or less than 100 for sure. So that's that's the difference in clinical management. So higher the BMI, 
difficult to get into the normal BMI. But lower the BMI, you have a higher chance of getting into the, the normal BMI, either you are a male or a female. So what is clinically meaningful weight loss? It's about 5 to 10% of weight loss is called as clinically meaningful weight loss. So you look at this, the same BMIs. If you want to have a clinically meaningful weight loss, higher the BMI, you do better. So when you see a patient who has 35 or 40 BMI, you are actually looking at a clinically meaningful weight loss of 5 to 10 percent, which is achievable and, and when the patient satisfaction is there. Is it worth doing it? Is it worth doing it is the issue. So when you have a BMI 40, are you going to have a 10 percent weight reduction? When you have 130 kilos, are you going to have a 10 percent weight reduction? Is it worth? data shows us. Now if you look at the glycemic improvement in patients having prediabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, 2.5 percent weight loss have a huge impact on your reversible and 10 percent reduction will have almost reversible change. Now if you look at the glycemic improvement in type 2 diabetes, about 2.5 to 15 percent, that's a tremendous improvement in your glycemic. Actually that's the maximum you can achieve with the, with the weight. And if you look at the triglycerides, HDL, sleep apnea, all about 10% weight reduction gives the maximum outcome of the complications. So look at this. So very, very good data. And if you look at even a, even a hepatic, uh, hepatic uh, non-alcoholic uh, liver disease and all, 10% weight reduction is, is perfect. In, in getting into less complications. Uh, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, even, even I just want to show that something has, you know, that's gone out the, in the polycystic ovarian disease and subfertility, 10% weight reduction gives you a massive outcome, right? Therefore, try and promote that. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, majority of the patients when you're clinically managing obesity, five to 10% weight loss, which is a clinically meaningful weight loss, should be the way forward, unless you can't do that. and this has been supported by many research and many, many colleges and societies have, have accepted 5-10% clinically meaningful weight loss, which is acceptable throughout the world at the moment. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, when you, according to your BMI, you decide how you manage obesity. And if you look at any, any BMI category, whatever the BMI diet is important. So there are two guys sitting in front of me who are the nutrition uh, specialists and professors who any of the BMI, you need a diet and exercise. That's, that's no argument about it. But behavioral therapy is also across the BMI, you need a behavioral treatment. And if you look at the pharmacotherapy, you're probably looking at when you are having uh, BMI above more than 30 and majority of the patients. So bariatric surgery, you think about either 35 or 40. We have come down the bariatric surgery up to about 33 because with, the, with more and more experience, we are coming down with the BMI. But you have to, you have to understand which category needs uh, which kind, what kind of treatment unless you are going to fail this treatment. If a woman sits in front of you, 130 kilos, she's asking you a zero figure which you are unable to give. She's going to be uh, unsatisfied with you with that uh, answer, but you have to talk about truth. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, lifestyle will reduce about 5% of weight reduction and majority of the time, lifestyle plus pharmacotherapy, about 5 to 10, 15%, bariatric surgery up to about 40% of experience with about 500 bariatric surgeries, about 40% of weight reduction. So what are the impact on long-term medical complications in obesity-related comorbidities? Hypertension remission is persistent up to about 10 years if you can maintain your weight. Dramatically, surgery is better, medical treatment is not too bad if you can maintain it. Hypertension, new hypertension is also less. If you have diabetes, there is a huge outcome with the surgical options, but even the medical options is about 10% persistent uh, reduction with that. And if you look at dyslipidia, the, the, the answer is the same. If it, it is important, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, think about the phases of obesity. You initially start the obesity by treating diet, exercise, and, and medications. That's the first phase, 33, first three to six months. You reduce weight, then you need to maintain weight, which is the most important thing in the weight management. What will happen if you don't do that? they gain into the same weight. Patient come and say, doctor, I lost about 15 kilos. Unfortunately, last three months I came to the same weight. Why is this? Why is this? Is there evidence based? Yes. When you have before weight reduction and after weight reduction, there are things happening there. When you reduce weight, there is a hunger is going to be continuous 
for you because there is increased ghrelin, reduced polypeptide vibe, reduced CCK and GLP reduction, insulin reduction, leptin reduction. You are continuously, continuously hungry. At the same time, what will happen is that there are certain mediators will, will go down and also causes energy, reduce energy expenditure. They are very, very uh, unable to do exercise. They feel uh, very lethargic. So they gain into the same weight. When they get in the same weight, because of this metabolic adaptation, they are fine. So how we, when you manage obesity, the first question you should ask the patient, are you hungry? If the patient is hungry, your management is wrong. That's not going to work. My dear, that's going, not going to work. That's, that's a question you should ask. I'm sure the, um, the, the Kalupahan and Ryan will talk about it, therefore I'm not going to talk about it. But that is very, very important. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, important thing is to manage weight, have a long-term plan of weight management, then you will have a successful weight management. Management obesity is a, is a multidisciplinary team work in physician, endocrinologist, nutrition, then sometimes nurses and other healthcare workers, psychiatrists, everybody needs to be involved in this management of, uh, management of obesity. Not only them, the surgical options are also there. And bariatric surgery is one of the best uh, options for, for uh, morbid obese patients. Therefore, ladies and gen gentlemen, reversing the obesity epidemic is a shared responsibility of you and I. You need to understand that all of us need to do something in terms of reducing obesity epidemic. Uh, it's, if, I, if I can stimulate you to think about obesity, treating obesity in future, that's what I'm looking at. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, that the obesity is a chronic progressive disease, clustering of complications, and evaluation and treatment is so difficult, but my colleagues will talk about how, how do you work. But cure is the best, where the prevention is the best in terms of this. But when you have a, this kind of a patient coming to you with a 180 kilos of weight and saying that I can't do my work, I'm sleeping all the time, I can't drive, my family life is over. If you offer treatment, you will get a, this kind of a man who is a successful man in life and doing extremely well. And, uh, and doing, and, and like when you treat with a myocardial infarction, sending a patient home live, I think this is almost the same. And if you get a, this kind of a girl who has, who has, you know, had lots of problems in life and, and depressed and unable to get on with the family because no children, and an option is this. Therefore, uh, management of obesity, not to cause, you know, a, a nicer looking man or a woman, but uh, reducing complications and managing as a perfect disease. Thank you. Thank you, Udita. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. I, I, I hope uh, Udita is ready to answer a few questions. Uh, not really. That actually, uh, you know, if you can usually weight reduction, now earlier we, when you have a weight reduction, we, we say that have a gradual weight reduction because people thought that uh, the, the fatty liver disease worsened and so on, but now there are enough and more data to suggest that there's nothing like that. So actually when you are trying to uh, reduce weight, if you can achieve in about three to six months, that's actually quite, uh, quite uh, safe. And then uh, the, the thing is to maintain the weight is uh, the lifelong. Let me also thank uh, my senior registrar, Dr. Umesha, for helping me to get these slides together. Thank you, Umesha. Thank you, Udit. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, uh, let me invite Professor Anil Jayavardhan, clinical nutritionist and senior lecturer at the Department of Physiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. Uh, Professor Jayavardhan will discuss about obesity trends in the world and Sri Lanka. Good morning, everyone. And first of all, I must thank uh, Dr. Guru Singh, uh, Guru Singh and the organizing committee for the inviting me for this uh, wonderful event. And I think we have done obesity day probably five, six years before in the SLM, but after that we couldn't celebrate it in this, this kind of level. So it is really a national need. So I'm very glad that Endocrine, Endocrine College now has, uh, came forward and start this uh, workshop on the or lecture series on the obesity trend. But when I took the uh, program, I, I saw it's a very complete, you know, there's a, a, a nutrition part done by the renowned nutritionist or our nutrition professor and there are exercise sessions, there are medical aspects also covered for the endocrinologist and there are surgeons. So I was thinking what should be the, my role. So I might, uh, my title was probably like a trend of the obesity world and Sri Lanka. 
I'm not a really endoc uh, epidemiologist or something. So to but justify to this talk as well as not to overlap with the many other speakers. So I will discuss mainly about the Sri Lankan evidence, which is very important for all of you. Because obesity is a quite associated with the cultural aspect also. Probably what we do in the uh, Europe, we cannot apply here. But I don't go for the detail of management, which is beyond my role. Uh, but surely I'll discover the local evidence. So there are a few things I won't declare before this presentation. I don't have any conflict of interest with the uh, food industry or pharmaceutical industry. But in this presentation, I have some conflict of interest. So I'll be a little biased for the, our research. And most of evidence is coming from the uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. And during this presentation, of course, I will discuss about the global context to some extent. Then probably the important part for us is a South Asian context because we are a little different to the probably white Caucasians or Negroid or Mongoloid. So probably Sri Lanka's obesity pattern is very relevant for the South Asian pattern. And then the Sri Lankan picture, which is very important for the all of you. And surely I discuss about prevalence and trend and associated factors and body composition, BMI cutoff, which already touched from the Dr. Bulugahapit here, and body weight perception. Probably that's kind of unique thing because now we have several programs here and I can see over 100 audience. But when you go to the outside, people think obesity is a sign of the prosperity. Oh, they, they like to be obese. So what we are doing here may not be useful if you don't understand that. There are a lot of local data also related to obesity. You can use that for the, your future work also. Finally, we can't forget about the COVID. We are in the middle of two pandemic, probably COVID pandemic, as well as there's obesity pandemic also. So there's association between both. So that also I discussed at the end. And very comprehensive uh, data coming from this article in 2019 for the Lancet. And they analyzed over 100 million uh, children, adolescents, and adults. And they found a very simple thing. In, to, in the 40 years before, in 19, 75, obesity is very low. They didn't measure obesity here, they came with the BMI, mean BMI of the population. You can see most of countries are probably dark yellow or maximum like orange. So even orange is a BMI of like a 25. For the most of these uh, orange countries are coming from the Europe or uh, North America, those are Caucasians. So that was quite normal for them. It's not really obesity. And you can see our areas and South Asia, it's very, very light because actually we suffer mainly undernutrition or underweight in that time, not obesity really. But after 40 years, what we can see, all these developed countries, and especially North America and Europe and Australia and some Latin American countries are quite close to red. That means their BMI, mean BMI population has increased to over 30. And most of them are either overweight and obesity in these countries. For example, like a US, two thirds of adults are obese, either obese or overweight. So it's like a big problem. It's like not like a, uh, any other health problem because it's, it's everywhere. If you take a population 100, there are like 30 people with a overweight of over 30 and another 30 with a BMI of 25. But if you take a Sri Lanka or like a South Asian country, it's not that scary. So that was a quite interesting because African countries and South Asian countries are not very dark here. So probably our mean BMS is a little less. It's clear from this data also. Now you can see in the 2075, and mean BMI of the some regions are higher, especially the uh, Central and East European countries, European countries or developed countries. After 20 years, uh, 40 years, you can see same pattern. Probably you can see a little more uh, Middle East countries also in the after 40 years, which was quite low in the beginning. But still, South Asian countries, you can see those are the, this, this light pink or orange color dots are actually South Asians. So we do not have very high BMI. So what we can see here, actually like one of take home message, there's a clear evidence, there's a global trend of obesity, but South Asia not a hotspot according to this data. So it's really true. Because we know diabetes is, is a main cause of the death in this region and cardiovascular diseases and non alcoholic fat liver. So we have a lot of obesity related health issues. But according to this data, no, not such a thing. Actually, 10 years before, we did a, 
uh, another article of South Asian obesity pattern. And we found something interesting. Yes, obesity level is not very high, but it is in the upward trend. These are quite old data. You can see there are like a, uh, uh, 1990 to probably 2005. The prevalence has doubled, but it's not very high compared to Europe. And very recently, and we, we came up with another review for the current obesity report, we found obesity is varied in the different part. For example, like India, some may is only 11%, some is like a 30%. So it's dependent on the uh, area of residence, like whether they are living in an urban area, rural area. But generally, if you take obesity, we have used Asian cutoff also, which is not very high value. So what you can see, they are not very high. So probably you'll be surprising why we are talking about obesity very much, because it's not very high in this region. And if you take Sri Lanka, this data comes from the, uh, Professor Prasad Katulanda, it's not very high. It's only 9.2. So this is a BMI cut of 27.5. And there's a national level data. So there's something actually missing. With, when we see the South Asian obesity, it's not actually general obesity. It's not a gross obesity. It's mainly central obesity. And this data, again, very recent review from the Endocrinology and Metabolism Journal. And we found some, some countries Central obesity is over 70%. And even you, you can see in this story that many of us have a central obesity. So that's something different, which we don't see in the Caucasian population. They are quite big. They have muscles and they have weight and BMI is high, but probably they don't have a, such a metabolic problems. So what is a South Asian pattern I want to highlight here? We have an increased trend, but it's not general gross obesity, it's like abnormal obesity. So I will show the Sri Lankan data also. So this is a very different picture. Now if I move to the Sri Lankan data, uh, this is the only uh, national level study we have done 2005-2006 by Professor Prasad Katulanda. No one can do this kind of study after that. This is a the huge study, consists of 5,000 people. And later on, I revisit a small sample of that. What we saw that, according to Asian cutoff, which is we took like a 23 and 27.5 for the obesity, we have a, a overweight of 22.6 and obesity 7.2. And if you take a, a 9.2, sorry. And if you take a Caucasian cutoff, it's a 60.8, there's a BMI of 25 and 3.7. You can see the BMI is only Obesity is only 3.7 in this population. Overweight is high, but we are not very big. But we have a lot of metabolic problems. And there's another interesting factors also. We have a very different pattern. Now in the developed countries, people who are rich, educated, who are living in the urban area are thin. People who are living in the rural area and uneducated people, they are actually obese or they have more fat. But the Sri Lanka pattern is totally different. You can see, and in here, if you take an income pattern, and those who have highest income have a highest odd ratio for the obesity, which is totally different to uh, Western or no, uh, other world uh, picture. And if you take education level also, people who are educated have a higher risk for the obesity compared to who are uneducated. People who are in urban area, like cities, they have a high higher level of obesity, which is not we see in the developed countries. So probably your obese patients are educated and rich and probably living in the suburb or developed areas. So this is a very different pattern when you compare to the other part of the world. So you have to handle like that also because they are educated, but they are still obese. There's some reason for that because they have a purchasing power, because they have, they have money to buy food and eat. But in those developed countries, everyone can buy food. They can easily buy a KFC which is only two dollars or three dollars. But here it's expensive food. So poor people cannot buy that. Or poor cannot people can buy even normal food. So that's why poor people are thin and obese people are uh, rich people are obese. And if I plot this Sri Lankan trend, early data coming from the uh, Professor Devaka Fernando study in 2009, 2019, 1990. 
and which is not a big study, but it has both urban and rural population. And later on, 2006, we did a study, and 2011, another study, and later, and uh, Dr. Somosundaram, the Professor Kalupana's team, done another study, which is like a main urban area, like Colombo area. But you can see it's very scary. Last two decades, the prevalence of obesity has increased several times. You don't see this kind of trend in the other part of the world. If you take uh, even US, the obesity level is high, but trend is not high. They, they have quite stable obesity prevalence now. But in Sri Lanka, it has an upward trend. So what is another take home message? Yes, ob prevalence of obesity has reached to really dangerous level in Sri Lanka. So what you learned in the first lecture uh, by, uh, from uh, Dr. Bulugahapitiya, we, our, our patients have a risk for the these all metabolic problems like a diabetes, you name it, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, dyslipidia, and everything because it's like a pandemic now in the globally and Sri Lanka is like a real health issue. And this is already shared from the uh, Dr. Bulgapit also. So, and those senior endocrinologists and some nutritionists, we get together and we came with a cutoff. In that time, we didn't have much data, and but those expert group came up with a lower BMI cutoff. I think that was a really wise decision, even it's done like 10 years before. But health ministry did not appreciate that in that time. But I think now every doctor who appreciate the value of this having a low BMI, why it's important? Because we have a different pattern. Those who are in the obesity field, this is very common picture. Every, every, every obesity conference you go, you see this YUI paradox. And this tall gentleman is a, a British guy, white Caucasian, other uh, sm small guy is an Indian uh, professor. And Yachnik from the Poon, and both are endocrinologists. Both have a almost identical BMI. You can see it's only 22.3 and which is very safe according to any BMI cutoff. But if you see the body fat percentage, this Caucasian has a very low body fat percentage compared to South Asian. That's applicable for all of us. That size is very important. That's why we can't probably use the BMI cutoff for the Asian level. And we have local data also, which I would like to share. Actually, we published quite time back, like 2010, and in the very good journal, British Journal of Nutrition, one of the best journal, and we found this is again from the national level data for the 5,000 subjects. When we measure the anthropometry parameters and the metabolic parameters, what we found, those who have a beam of around 21 have a higher risk of metabolic risk factor. So the, those who have BMI less than 21 are quite safe, but with every BMI value, the risk for the metabolic parameters such as dyslipidemia, hypertension, uh, high triglyceride level, and uh, HDL level, everything will increase. So this is very important. So when you're addressing a patient, especially the prevention level, probably they want to gain weight, but still, no, in Sri Lanka, we should be very, very lean, very, very thin. Like Professor Kalupana should be like a BMI, like a 20, 21. And uh, so that is like a best shape for the Sri Lankan. Of course, we don't have much muscles, but that's fine we don't, if you don't get a heart attack. So you can live longer if you don't have muscles at all. So that's it. Our data coming from the metabolic parameters. Then uh, we did a review for the, our journal, Endocrine Journal, and we, we found with the BMI category, you can, you can clearly see risk of obesity increase for the diabetes and blood pressure and HDL and triglyceride metabolic syndrome. So you can see even BMI of uh, 23, the level has increased significantly. Those who have BMI of over 23, have a risk for the diabetes, or the prevalence of diabetes is like a 20%. That's a very high value. And so very safe to have a very low BMI, like 18.522. So this also we restate, yes, we should lose a very low BMI for the identify our obesity patients and, and help. Later on, like a two years before, we came at the body composition data also. Here we use a duty and dilution technique. That's a gold standard method to measure the body composition uh, community sample. And this is like a free living sample for the like a national data. And what we found for Sri Lankan to, to get like adequate amount of fat, our BMI should be very, very low. In other words, I'll show this one. Now, already uh, Dr. Bulukhapite uh, shared about uh, obesity, cut off, really cut off, because BMI is anthropometry parameters. 
you, there will be a bodybuilder who has a lot of muscles, but BMI should be high, but that person is not obese. So really obesity parameter is having excess body fat. So that's a real thing. So if you measure the body fat versus BMI cutoff for the female, and he used a 33, yeah, there are some people using like a 35, and at the BMI 23, Sri Lankan female get a 35% of body fat. So probably 33% 30, of body fat, probably less than 23 also. It's sweat quite, quite wise to use a lower BMI cutoff here. And even male, uh, 25 is a cutoff, fat percentage of 25. So BMI should be along 22.8. So it's, we have a local data now to justify having a lower BMI cutoff is safe for the, regarding metabolic parameters, regarding body composition. What we don't have at the moment, like a longitudinal data about the mortality, we don't know people who are BMI, lower BMI die early or they live long. We don't know, but uh, with the global data, we can see those who have a high BMI, yes, high risk for the old diseases as well as mortality. So what is other take home message? We have a higher adversity as well as with a lower BMI, we have a high risk for the metabolic parameters as well as uh, fat. Now I'll move, I'll move for a little bit interesting area, which we didn't discuss very much in this kind of forum, body weight perception. When I'm searching the obesity in the old Ceylon photos, when you Google it, you will get a lot of old Ceylon photos. Everyone is very, very thin. There's no one is obese. So only this gentleman, the gentleman in the middle, look obese for me, probably because of the clothing, but still he look obese. But he's the most powerful person there. And, and to make him more powerful, he used some cloth to make him big. Same thing happened in my wedding nose. I was very thin that time, but I had to wear a lot of clothes to make it a little big, that, uh, uh, that wedding suit. And even I couldn't go to the toilet with that. Uh, but that's a Sri Lankan context. So we believe this village officer, Gamula Dani, is a rich person. Surely he's a rich person. He's the healthy person because this Veda Mahat, everyone's supporting him. And he doesn't die because of the snake bite or anything, because he has a lot of support. He doesn't die because of the nutrient deficiencies. So he lived longer compared to those poor workers. And they look very, very thin. So we had a worth Weight, body weight perception. We think this middle guy is a probably inf influential or rich or healthy person compared to those thin workers. So we have that touch in society. We still have, if you talk to your grandparents, they still like you to be a little chubby, your children to be a little chubby. That's not their mistake because in the past, many of us die because of the malnutrition. So they have seen people who are big and they have more muscle, more energy stores, they survived. So, because of this context, we want to do a study, again like a 10 years before, and we measure the body weight perception and weight loss patterns from Sri Lankan adults. Because we are talking about obesity, we are having obesity today, but if you go to a society, we don't know what is their perception. So that's very important. To change the, uh, the, their mind, you have to know about their baseline data. Actually, what we found, around 50% knew about their weight and height. So many people do not know about their body weight. So if they don't know about the body weight, if they don't know about the height, they don't know anything about their BMI. Even they know BMI, uh, weight and height, still 50% did it wrong. So they don't know actually accurate body weight and accurate body height. Only 25% knew their accurate body weight. So this is the Sri Lankan context. So if you ask the people, they, they give height and weight, but it's wrong, probably. So if they don't have a right idea about the, their own anthropometry parameters, you can't change it. When you come to obesity perception, this is very interesting. Those who are obese and overweight. Now, if you take overweight con here, actually 70% of overweight men thinks they are either underweight or about right weight. They don't believe they are overweight or obese. This is Sri Lankan. And this is from like a larger survey. We, we cover all nine provinces. And if you take a female, we think they are also very conscious. No, over 50% of Sri Lankan women think they are normal or right weight. And I'll skip this one. And if you take a cardiac patients, now we know the obesity is a very, very strong risk factor for the cardiac disease, but it's worse there. If you take a obese or overweight cardiac patient, only 15% think they are overweight 
and around 85% thinks they are normal weight or they are even underweight. So this is Sri Lankan context. Not about cardiac patient. We, when we measure about uh, students, university students, we think they are conscious about the body weight. No, they are also not. 50% of overweight university students think they are the normal weight or underweight. Now we can see general population, the cardiac population, and university student, they don't pursue this as a problem. Even those who are obese and they come to nutrition clinic, this is a very recent publication, published like a few months before, and 10% of them think, oh, these are obese patients actually, think they are normal. So this is a problem in Sri Lanka. Very poor weight perception, weight perception very common in Sri Lanka. And awareness pro program, like here, like uh, this is a professional program, but all of you should go to the ground level and change the, our people's behavior. Otherwise, they don't lose weight. I'll quickly go to a few local data because probably it will be useful for you. And we found waist to height ratio is the best parameter to identify metabolism for the, our population. So if someone's waist is less than half of their height, which is a very good parameter and which is actually better than a BMI or waist because of waist hip ratio. So that's a good parameter and you don't need even a scale for that. You can take your height and you can take your uh, waist, still you can get idea. And other, now, like we encourage everyone to have a, like a balanced and varied diet also. Because if you take the same thing every day, probably you don't get all nutrient. But this is another problem. When you have a different food, we have find with a diet, diet di diversity, people who are eating different, different food, they have a higher obesity because of the food intake. Probably now, yesterday also you had a good lunch, probably you get a better buffet today, you will eat more food. Because there you get a lot of food variety. So the same thing. So this is very important for the application also. When you, when you want to go weight loss diet, you better go same thing, but it's a balance, same thing every day for the week. Then the appetite will reduce. So that, that food, you can easily lose their body weight also because of that. But it still is balanced. You have, there's a vegetable, there's a protein, there's rice, but same thing. So you can see Sri Lankan data, the diet diversity and food varieties is actually this factor. Another Sri Lankan data, actually there's a over 100 weight loss products apart from the medical pro, uh, uh, drugs. Now there are lysian drugs like Olistat, but apart from that there are over 100 weight loss supplements in that three months we found. Probably there are hundreds of the weight loss supplements in the market, none of them are effective. There are no real drugs. Uh, all these things are actually a waste of money. I think Dr. Bulgahapati already uh, shared about Sri Lankan experience, so, and this work done uh, by the Dr. Bulgahapati and Professor Tejan's team. And yes, bariatric surgery is the best way to lose weight for the obese patient, and especially for the morbid obese patient. You can't challenge that kind of result in any of the lifestyle management and the results are unmatched. And I don't go much detail about uh, dietary management, probably uh, Professor Kalupahan may share, but in Sri Lankan context, like a plate concept, plate model concept, having more vegetable, reducing carbohydrate with, from raw rice, and also another effective method for the losing body weight. And we have few local data also, and so those like a trainees, and if you want to measure the body composition, yes, we have developed uh, 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 and develop a validated equation for the biological impedance as well as uh, we have equations for the skin fold thicknesses also. So one of the other take home message, waist height ratio may be good parameter for the Sri Lankan and diet diversity is associated with obesity. So this is very important when you are giving a variety of food for the people and hundreds of weight loss supplement, they are not effective. Plate concept may be useful for the weight loss Bariatric surgery is a definitely best way for the weight loss for the obese patient. And we have some local data better to use it. In the last part of my presentation, I will touch about the COVID. I'll go very quickly. And because we can't forget about that. Actually, that study shows, this study we did before getting this vaccine and everything. So there's no essential vaccine. And most of countries have a, a travel restriction and more or less same policies. And we found the when the country has a higher amount of obesity prevalence, they have a higher rate of infection also that time, and compared to the country with a lower prevalence. So they are associated. These are ecological data. So don't think this is like a cause. So you have to interpret it very carefully, but these are quite eye-opening data. And similarly, for the mortality, which is very important in the, in the COVID, in the early part of the COVID, and 
those countries have a higher BMI, have a higher mortality, but especially countries with a higher income have a little less. Now, if you take a Qatar or Saudi, oh, of course they have a higher BMI, but at the same time have facility compared to Latin American countries. They are quite middle income countries, they, have, they don't have uh, much facilities. But the countries with a lower BMI have a actually very low risk for the mortality in that time before vaccine and uh, policy changes uh, happen. So what is the reason for that? With obesity, we all know it reduces the, your cardiorespiratory reserves as well as it increases the risk for the immunity also. So yeah, what, what is it? Other take home message is very important for today's context because obesity is another risk factor for the uh, reducing the risk for the infection as well as mortality. So if your patient do not want to lose because of the heart disease or diabetes, but still, this is another point, you can encourage them to lose weight. In the summary, yes, obesity is a pandemic. In developed countries, have a highest impact according to global data. But South Asia have higher adversity and lower BMI, so making them more vulnerable for the metabolic diseases. And prevalence of obesity has increased several times in, in Sri Lanka last couple of decades. And we have a very unique pattern, like rich people are obese and educated people are obese. That's a unique pattern. And we should lose lower BMI cutoff to identify obesity in Sri Lankan adult. Unfortunately, we have very low body weight perception that we have to change. That's our, all of our duty. This is one of starting point. You learn ob about obesity and go to the ground level and change their perception about obesity. And we have some useful local data you can use in the future studies. And finally, yes, obesity is a risk factor for the both COVID infection as mortality. And I'd like to acknowledge my mentor, Professor Prasad Katranda, as well as my colleagues, uh, Professor Priyanka Hanutung, and my international uh, supervisors and partners like Professor Anup Mr. and Andrew Hills. And of course, these things is not possible, help of my research students and research assistant. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor Daniel, uh, for that very informative and very interesting presentation. Um, actually, it's really interesting to hear that uh, the body uh, waist circumference to height ratio is taken as a denominator of uh, uh, the obesity demarcation. So I would like to ask you whether it is globally accepted and widely used and whether there are differences between the, for the Caucasians and Asians and whether there are any cutoffs specific for the gender base? Yes, it's a very good question. Actually, there's a group working on this area also in the world. So this is a wide recognized now. There's a cutoff also. It should be, your waist should be half of your height. So if someone's waist is more than half of your height, consider high risk. If it's less than half of your height, it's considered less risk. And it's very easy. You don't need even a scale. You don't need even a stereometer. If you have a t tape or even you have a string, you can take your height and you don't want to measure it and bend it. And if it's a, if, if two points are uh, touching, that means you, you, you have a less risk. If not touching, that means you have a high risk. And of course, there are meta analysis and everything shows, uh, which is applicable for the all ethnic groups. Yes, yes. That's another advantage because sometimes BMI people believe because of the muscle mass, men, men should be less risk compared to women, but, and waist also, there are two different cutoffs, but here only one cutoff for the both gender. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience to Professor Daniel? No. 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 We have done studies of like cinnamon and things, but those are not also very effective in the weight loss. But effective, we have done the clinical trials of the cinnamon and zinc, both are effective for the controlling glycemia. But obesity-wise, there's no significant effect. Uh, sir, uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, sir. Sir, is there any research that obese patient uh, expect uh, obese patient expectation from a doctors? So, when a patient comes to obese patient, what are they expecting from the doctors? Is there any research available? Uh, to my knowledge, we don't have. But in the in the clinical practice. Like Dr. Buluk said, they want to be normal. Uh, all obese patients, they want to be normal. So that's almost impossible. So actually, another take-home message is uh, you should arrange them to 
modest weight loss plan not like not to be like a normal so 5 to 10 percent is a modest weight loss and then with a good time period like a three to six months it's depend you know if someone is only 70 kilogram that patient has to lose only seven kilograms you don't need the six month probably three months is sufficient but if someone is like 120 kilogram probably you need like a six month to lose weight and in the in the in the clinical experience yes that's their plan so that's another thing you have to change in the in the beginning also otherwise they will be disappointed they won't come they want you to make normal but it's almost impossible and most important part of the weight management i think uh, uh, our coming speakers will discuss but it's not a weight loss it's a weight maintenance that's the most important part of weight management and there are many diet in it's it's common in the market and even now there are facebook group with like over 200,000 people with the, this keto diet and there are very odd diets but you can't practice this kind of diet for the longer period so that's really useless you should be able to eat food and we get a pleasure from the food and if you cut down the food from your patient that's like a actually quite unethical because you are cut down they are a very important part of their life so weight loss plan should be very short period probably like a three to six months it's dependent on the body weight thereafter they should be able to eat wisely and they should be very active to maintain the weight and there's no food restriction, but of course, they have to go for the wise decision. They can't eat very high calorie food every day, but surely they can eat almost every food, controlling portion size and frequencies. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ralil. I also have one little question. As you clearly mentioned, the, our Sri Lankans are much different from the rest of the world, like uh, when, you ca when it comes to socioeconomic uh, distribution of the weight. Uh, our people, you know, poorer social economic groups uh, tend to be thinner than, and, and the body perceptions, everything is different. So, at national level, have we incorporated this data into our practice guidelines to, like, can we do that uh, at some point? Like, yeah, I think that should be the best way because even we have, there's a, over 100 people here, that's not very effective. So, we have to change the policies. Now, like, endocrine society did for the having a lower BM cutoff then probably we need to have education program or what some strategies to change how people's behavior about the body weight because they still believe it's, it's big, especially it's very common to childhood population because like a chubby child is considered very healthy but they are quite unhealthy because they end up with a metabolic problem so I think at the moment to my knowledge there are no such a program in the health ministry level but those who are an active in that field actually uh, better to to answer that kind of message to the uh, ground level, like emotional level and midwife level, and change our Sri Lanka behavior, Sri Lanka people's behavior. That's the most effective way. Prevention is the most effective way. This obesity epidemic we can't handle by endocrinologists or nutritionists now because we need everyone's support because it's an epidemic in the country now. Uh, so now let's move on uh, to the next uh, discussion for the day. Uh, so this will be on uh, childhood obesity. Uh, and uh, this lecture will be delivered by Dr. Sumudu Seneviratna, pediatric endocrinologist attached to the Department of Pediatrics, uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. A very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. And at the outset, let me thank the uh, Endocrine um, College for giving me this opportunity to speak about a, a topic uh, which I hope that you will be, uh, agree with me at the end of this um, session is not something limited to people looking after children. It's not an area which uh, actually deals only with pediatricians, but is relevant to all healthcare professionals as well as all people in the community. Because uh, as uh, Professor Ranil quite rightly pointed out, childhood obesity um, is, um, is a manifestation of a multitude of problems, and it is probably the, the beginning of adult obesity. And it is um, a culmination of a major societal change we have experienced over the last few decades. So I hope uh, we can all join hands together to deal with childhood obesity. So as the previous speakers quite rightly pointed out, um, obesity has been um, increasing at a tremendous rate over the past four decades. So this is data from 1975 to 2016. And at, a, uh, at the first glance, uh, you may think that the first two lines which uh, deal with adult uh, obesity rates. Um, the top line uh, is with, uh, on um, 
women with obesity and the second line on uh, males with obesity. Though the numbers are very much larger when you compare the adult population, if you just look at the increase in the childhood obesity rates from 1975 uh, to 2016, uh, you can see that the rise has been almost tenfold. So from 6 million children in 1975, or 6 million boys in 1975, to 74 million boys in 2016. So the, the increase or the rapidity of increase is very dramatic. And um, some of you may have been born around those uh, years, 1975 onwards. So uh, you may recall that when you went to school, I don't think that 10% of our classmates were obese. But now, if you look at Sri Lankan schools, we have very high obesity rates, and the global obesity rate is 10%. So they are talking about staggering numbers of children being afflicted by this condition. And uh, obesity sets in a vicious cycle, so a healthy child who becomes mildly obese, then, as the previous speakers pointed out, find it very hard to go back to their previous stage. And if we don't intervene, the mildly obese child become, will become moderately obese, severely obese, and then be the uh, obese adults whom we are seeing. So I think it starts from very early life, and we should be looking at targeting the prevention of obesity and the very early stages of obesity. And I think that's the importance of looking at childhood obesity in a, uh, in a wider forum such as this. Now, uh, children who suffer from obesity uh, face a multitude of problems. Um, and one of the first problems and one of the most major problems that afflict them is the psychosocial impact of obesity. So uh, uh, low self-esteem, depression, eating disorders are among the first manifestations of obesity in childhood. The psychosomatic impact is pretty dramatic. Uh, this is you know, a global um, kind of perspective, but I will speak a little bit on my personal experiences as we go along. In addition to that, we all know about the cardiovascular problems like dyslipidemia, hypertension, uh, and um, diabetes. Uh, and we are seeing type 2 diabetes in children as young as 10 years, something I did not see 10 years ago. So even type 2 diabetes is now becoming an area of uh, a pediatric practice as well. So that's the kind of trends that we are observing uh, in Sri Lanka today. And uh, in addition to the endocrine problems, they also have um, increased tendency to develop asthma, very poor exercise tolerance, which in turn um, makes them less prone to exercise, kind of setting in a vicious cycle. And children too suffer from musculoskeletal problems and um, a multitude of you know, multisystemic involvements as well as adults. So uh, if you look at the causes of obesity, um, we all know that lifestyle plays a major part. And of course, there is a genetic uh, component. Very often, uh, when we see children being referred for obesity, they have either one or two obese parents. So I think it, there is a strong genetic tendency. But however, what we must remember is we cannot um, differentiate between common genes and common lifestyle when you take a family. Because those parents may also have behavioral factors which led to their obesity, which is now kind of the same lifestyle that the children are also leading. So genetics and lifestyle are very well-established uh, risk factors for obesity. And I would like to talk about a, a different aspect, and that is in utero program, which is now being recognized as, uh, 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 again, a major contributor to the causation of obesity. Um, if we take lifestyle, we know that it's a simple uh, uh, disbalance between energy intake and energy expenditure. Um, but energy balance is regulated by the hypothalamus and many neuroregulators in our body. So what causes a lifestyle change to bring about a change that overrides the homeostasis of our body. For instance, if we take sodium levels, we can ingest a lot of salt, but we would maintain normal uh, sodium levels. But what happens in weight? Why is it being overridden by our lifestyle changes? And um, 
one of the factors which I believe is uh, leading to this is in utero programming. And, um, and that deals with babies who are exposed to maternal undernutrition or maternal overnutrition or gestational diabetes during their uh, in utero life are programmed or their weight management or weight control is dysregulated. I don't have much time to go into that in detail, but there is a lot of data emerging which, um, which proves this point. So uh, this is just a very basic um, diagram showing, uh, depicting this change. So if you look at the main diagram, what we see is there we see trouble at both ends of the birth weight spectrum. So if I just ask you all to take a moment and think back to if, what your birth weight was. And if you find that you were below 2.5 kilograms at birth or more than 3.7, 3.8 kilograms uh, at birth, maybe you were born with an increased tendency to develop obesity type 2 diabetes. And that is something which affects all of us. We are all, you know, born in the same manner. And so it's, it's very important to recognize the importance of this when we talk about obesity management. Um, and uh, if you look at the lower graph, this is more recent data from 2012, including 600, more than 600,000 people from, 60, uh, from 26 countries globally. And you can see now the initial graph shows birth weight against the risk of obesity. Uh, and you can see in the second graph where you are looking uh, more at more recent data, the uh, right hand limb of the graph is showing a dramatic increase. That is the high birth weight range. And you can see that now the balance, though we initially spoke about undernutrition and uh, fetal programming uh, by the Barker hypothesis, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, currently the biggest problem we are facing is maternal obesity and maternal um, uh, uh, diabetes leading to adverse fetal programming. And um, so, uh, and this starts before conception. So the, if the mother is undernourished, then the baby is exposed to fetal undernourishment. And if the mother is overnourished, either before pregnancy or she develops, ex she could saw an excessive weight gain during pregnancy or she develops diabetes during pregnancy, then the baby uh, suffers from fetal overnutrition. And both babies who are small and large exposed to undernutrition or overnutrition, we have very good epidemiological data that they are the people who are more prone to obesity in later life. So effectively, that sits in an intergenerational obesity cycle. So this is not only genetics, but also due to fetal programming. So even if a, a thin lady um, develops later onset uh, diabetes, obesity, before she uh, starts a reproductive life, then even though she may not have a strong family history of obesity and diabetes, she will propagate or set in a vicious cycle by the fetal programming. And this, these children will be exposed to fetal or neonatal obesity and they start manifesting childhood obesity as young as infancy. So we are seeing a different trend. When we saw children who were exposed to undernutrition, they developed obesity in adult life. But when these babies are exposed to un overnutrition, overnutrition, they start manifesting obesity very early on. And we are seeing a huge surge in young children presenting with obesity. Most of them have been exposed to maternal obesity or diabetes in utero. And so these children then continue to be obese adults. And with that background, I would now like to share some of my experiences and a practical approach to how we deal with obesity in childhood. And I'm thankful to the previous speakers for setting a very scientific background to what I'm going to say today now. So um, firstly, when you see a, a, a young person who is uh, presenting with obesity, we need to assess the degree of obesity. And I agree uh, very strongly with what Professor uh, Ranil, ja, uh, Ranil mentioned previously, that our population has no perception uh, of whether they are obese or not. So most of our referrals come from uh, children who present to the OPD for other diseases, and the MO 
and the OPD picks up that they are obese. So when they come to me, I ask all children who present to me, do you know why you came to this clinic? And about more than half of them have no idea. Um, so it starts with you know, making them realize that they have a problem. So I think we as healthcare professionals need to be very alert because it is a problem that our population is not aware of. And uh, I think it stems back to the older ages where bigger was thought to be better. Culturally, people do believe that big kids are healthy. And it's a huge misconception. So um, if you talk a little bit more about the, uh, accessing the degree of obesity, so it's very important to actually go back. This is a very practical point, but you need to calculate the age from the date of birth because our population, again, has various ways of calculating their children's age. And then you have to plot it on a uh, specific growth chart. So we have gender-specific BMI charts uh, de derived by the WHO. Um, and again, I would like to highlight some of the uh, factors uh, high, uh, brought about by the previous speaker's presentations. Now, the BMI uh, cutoffs we use for children are based on or extrapolated from the cutoffs for the global population. Um, and these are uh, the, so we take children whose BMI is above plus one SD as overweight, those whose BMI is above plus two standard deviations as obese, and those with a BMI above plus three SD as severely obese. How are these cutoffs derived? They are extrapolated from the BMI at 18 years of age. So a child growing along the plus 2SD uh, line would, um, as an adult, have a BMI of plus 2SD, which correlates with the cutoff for obesity, which is 30 in adults. So we have not changed this definition to suit children in Sri Lanka. So we are using extrapolating from the global data and not the Asian data. And I think uh, what the, uh, maybe we need to look at these things also because we have a, as the, uh, we have a very special population where we are more prone to metabolic complications with a lower degree of BMI. And I have some data also which will prove this point. So um, moving on, uh, so once you assess the degree of obesity, one of the important things is to exclude pathological causes of obesity. And um, I use this rule of thumb, usually pathological obesity is very, very uncommon, and it is due to either endocrine causes or syndromic disease. So children who are obese due to overnutrition are tall, they are invariably tall for their genetic potential. So I just quickly screen them whether they are, have short stature, whether they have any learning disability, whether they look different, whether they have dysmorphism or whether they have cushionoid or hypothyroid features. And I think that's pertinent to adult practice as well, but the height is very specific to children. So it's a very easy measure that we use. Any child who is short and obese, that's a red flag for looking for secondary causes or pathological causes of obesity. But otherwise, a majority of patients have nutritional obesity. It's very uncommon to see them presenting with obesity uh, as the first manifestation if they have pathological obesity. Right, and then, uh, so the third thing that we do is to assess for modifiable risk factors in these children's lives. So um, there are four main factors that I use, which is based on my practice. So there are four reasons I believe that children in Sri Lanka are becoming obese. The and in no particular order, firstly, excessive rice intake. So huge amounts of rice being um, um, con uh, consumed, and this is encouraged by their parents, their grandparents, who, want them, who think they need rice to exist. <laughs> so that's the conception or a, a kind of a, 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 a perception in our community. And in addition to that persuasion to eat, then children are exposed to food advertising targeting high fat, high um, sugar and, uh, and sugar containing foods, processed foods. So on one hand they are uh, being told to eat more carbs from their 
older you know family members and on the other hand they are being targeted by food advertising companies advertising unhealthy food so children are real target for obesity and in addition with uh, certainly with the covid pandemic we are seeing screen time going up to 10 to 12 hours per day so massive increases in screen time uh, and at present it also includes the educational time as well as the leisure time activity so it's it's obviously contributing to the worsening of the obesity pandemic and children's leisure time activities have now moved from um, outdoor activities to screen based activities so it's very important to assess what they like so we go and explore how much time screen time they have and whether they actually play or whether they have time for play engage in sports and other physical activities and um, so finally we assess for complications so uh, i think these were already talked upon and this is a basic um, screening profile that we conduct in any child above uh, five years of age who presents we don't uh, we we kind of follow up younger children um, and do uh, if they have very severe obesity then we will screen and this is a graph showing uh, the rate of metabolic complications we encountered in children presenting to our clinic uh, a few years back and you can see that oh, i'm really sorry the something has happened to the percentage so we are talking about uh, going from 10 percent to 60 percent um, and you can see that uh, 45 percent of children had fatty liver um, and uh, dyslipidemia rates were also very high and uh, less of uh, dysglycemia but these are very high rates and 72 percent had one metabolic complication at presentation very high rates so it's very important to screen these children and at least have a baseline value so that we can use it also as part of the motivational counseling and also we are recognizing the psychosocial impact of obesity we recently conducted a study looking at quality of life uh, of children with overweight and obesity and found they had significantly impaired quality of life and their physical quality of life worsened with uh, a higher degree of bmi um, and most children who present come very distressed because of bullying they are being called names and this leads to social isolation because these children are being bullied they don't leave the classrooms to go out to the playground and play um, they also feel embarrassed to exercise so it's very important i think to realize these limitations when we advise children to engage or improve their physical activity because this is a group who are very suppressed and blamed by society and i think they suffer really their psychosocial health is very impaired compared to other children and indeed more so sometimes than children with other very more obvious diseases because of the stigma sometimes the parents themselves are, are actually name calling without realizing the the negative impact on the child we have to speak to siblings parents and say don't use these terms and so it's it's something i think as healthcare professionals we need to be aware of and so very briefly uh, let me talk about how how i do it so um, we've we've used two models in our obesity clinics one is individualized counseling which i think most of you uh, must be doing and other is the not, uh, the other is group counseling so over the last maybe five six years i've been uh, doing these focal group discussions for children the first uh, new presenters uh, and have spending about an hour or one and a half hours with them exploring their perceptions and uh, uh, kind of working with them to kind of have a, like a team building effort and establish rapport and help them and so this deals mainly with educating these children and motivating them and getting their family also involved um, I don't have any um, data to share with you now, but uh, we did look at uh, outcomes between individualized counseling and group counseling because I personally felt it was really making an impact. Mm -hmm. But when we looked at the data, we did not find, uh, we looked at two year follow up data. We, at six months, there was a 
improvement uh, or better weight outcome in those receiving uh, focal group discussions, but at two years, there was no sustained benefit. And what we found was two years after you know, attending our clinic, children who presented with a particular uh, BMI had increased their BMI as they were growing, but their body fat percentage by BIA was similar. So I think what uh, Professor Ranil mentioned, we were at least achieving weight control or stability, though we were not achieving weight loss. And I think that's the harsh reality of obesity management, even for children. But uh, just yesterday, I saw three youngsters, adolescents, uh, 13, 15, and 12, all three with beautiful weight management. So that's very encouraging. And uh, many, of, I asked them, and they said, the education and the group counseling, they still remembered it and they said that motivated them. So I think it's an individual choice and maybe the people who really are motivated, it must be helping. So I think it's a good a way to explore this because it helps them feel connected and they don't feel marginalized because they open out when there are lots of other children speaking about their concerns. Um, and um, so we explore uh, why obesity is harmful um, and that the reason for obesity, uh, we kind of use a three-wheeler model where we say you put uh, energy to a, uh, put fuel to a three-wheeler to for it to run. And so food is similar. We ingest food for physical activity, and if we, we don't do it, then it stays put, and that's what is leading to this central obesity. Um, and uh, yep, so. <laughs> Okay, petrol is, we won't talk about that today. <laughs> so maybe uh, Fermin would help <laughs> if you look at that. But food, as, uh, as the previous speaker said, food is part of our life. It's, it's a form of pleasure. So it's just a matter of what we suggest is um, harm um, substitute. So all children love sweets. And we don't say stop sweets. What we say is, shall we consider something like fruits? And what are your favorite fruits? People are not aware, parents are not aware of their favorite fruits of their children because they are just bringing them what they want, which is what is focused by food advertising. And there is no advertising of fruits, vegetables, water. No way have I ever seen advertisement except sometimes in health forums. So I think we are living in a very socially programmed, conditioned environment. And what I do over that hour is to try to show them how they are being programmed. And believe me, uh, children, 10, 12 year olds, really hate it when they get the concept that actually people are trying to make them eat unhealthy stuff. Once they understand that concept, they really feel motivated. And it, 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 it's very, um, I mean, fruitful, I think, working with young children this way. Um, so we already talked about the sociocultural changes, and, and we also explained to them that there are some unmodifiable factors which make, make them more prone to develop obesity compared to their classmates. So some children would feel, okay, I'm eating as much as my um, friend, and why am I getting obese? So that's probably the, the issue of fetal programming and genetics. And so you need to work harder to maintain your health, but we put the responsibility on the kid. It's, it's your job to look after your health. One thing that I would really like to uh, say as a take-home message is please do not blame children for obesity, even their parents, because we see a lot of blame being put on the mother and on the child. But this is a societal change, and we all need to work together de to deal with it instead of victimizing those affected. Um, and these are the favorite foods of children when they present to my clinic. Um, Invariably, I just know, I just read out, I mean, just read out the list because I, invariably this is what they are eating. And I put, I haven't, you know, stopped the trade names because they are being advertised anyway. Um, so, um, so we put in a lot of time explaining uh, how they can do this and find out individual ways that they can do it, but in a group. And it's very important to get the parents on board because parents are... Uh, the gateway for these children to access unhealthy food. So I tell the parents, unless you provide money to your child, or unless you bring it home, your child has no access to food. So you don't blame the child, you also uh, look at this and you know, bring home only healthy food for the whole family. It has to stop at the doorway. 
um, and family exercise. What we encourage is most of the parents who come into the clinic with their kids are obese themselves. So I say you have to be a role model. You can't tell your child to exercise because you're obese and not exercise yourself. So we encourage family involvement at least to a certain degree and also try to get the siblings involved. Um, and positive uh, reinforcement is very important. We set goals. Uh, in children, we usually recommend weight management, maintenance, and if they can maintain their weight for two years, as they're growing, they will grow into their normal BMI. So that's very effective in children, but it's, it's, it's difficult to achieve in all cases. But that's what I saw in the children I saw uh, yesterday. They had achieved, maintained their weight and thus grown into their um, height. And finally, um, I think prevention is the key uh, in managing obesity given the, the difficulties and the lack of pharmaceutical safe methods to reduce obesity. So bariatric surgery is not available for children uh, and uh, so we have only lifestyle management to offer them and it's very, very time consuming and intense. Indeed, I spend much more time talking to a child with obesity than to any other child with a much more complex uh, endocrine disorder. So I think all of us need to deal with it. I think every single um, citizen needs to be now advocating a healthy lifestyle. And I think an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There is no better words, I think, uh, to describe the situation. So, uh, and based on what I spoke about fetal programming, we do need to think of a life course approach. This is what is recommended by the World Health Organization. And what it means really is that we should start preventing obesity starting from the girl child and even the father's health is now, uh, I mean, we're seeing more evidence that paternal factors are also leading to um, obesity programming. So it starts with the adolescent health. A highly neglected field, I think, in all aspects of medicine, adolescent health and adolescent lifestyle. I think this is where it starts. So that leads to preconceptional care, antenatal care. And we need to encourage people to achieve a healthy weight before planning a pregnancy. Um, and also the concept that bigger is not better. I think we all need to uh, give this message. Bigger was better in, uh, uh, in the 10th century, 5th century when it was a sign of prosperity. Today it's a sign of ill health. So um, encourage healthy foods. We have beautiful fruits and vegetables, tropical country, but we hardly ever see any advertising like this. So um, we need to start doing this. We've done this through the Chandimandi project, uh, which we did from 2017 um, by the Sri Lanka Cardiovascular Initiative in collaboration with the um, Endocrine College and the Ministry of Health and Education. And that we've shown some wonderful results where our children who uh, followed this, um, who, who were exposed to a storybook and self-monitoring of their diet by a sticker book. Uh, we now have the one-year follow-up data. Children who were obese at the beginning, who followed the program successfully, have achieved a reduction in their BMI at a community school level. So I think this sort of programs, we hope that the Ministry of Health and Education will support us to kind of work together with the college to kind of uh, do a uh, more community work. Uh, so educating and empowering the community, I think, is the way forward. Um, and three simple basic rules, uh, replace unhealthy food with fruits, vegetables and water, exercise daily for one hour, uh, advocate something that each person enjoys. You can't do it your whole life if you don't enjoy it, and limit screen time. And edu please educate everyone at every opportunity you can. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Somodo, for that very informative and wonderful presentation. Now, the, uh, now it's open for questions. I think she will be happy to take a few questions from the audience. Um, so what we did was the initial visit, we, uh, some groups had um, the group counseling. So it was just one visit, the initial visit. And then subsequent visits were individualized counseling that we usually do. And there was another group who only received individual counseling. Yes. So it was just a focal. And maybe repeated uh, group counseling is the way forward, I think. 
but in one sense it does help because rather than speaking to 10 children over 10 minutes each you speak to 10 children over one hour it's actually time um, time uh, saving but um, yeah you need to be really focused but i do think it, it does make impact though you couldn't demonstrate it scientifically Um, that's a very good question, and thank you, because only they know, uh, basically. But I think there are some key things which emerged. One is no one is exploring what they like. Uh, the father comes and says, I brought this child a treadmill. He's not going on it, but he hates the treadmill. Uh, whereas no one is telling them to go out and play. So I think we have forgotten what play is like, what childhood is like. Tuition classes, educational pressure from parents, no time. There is no dedicated time. So what I say is you have to set a time before you leave the clinic, five to six every day. You have to make your child exercise, go out and play. Um, the other barriers is lack of safe spaces. So with the urbanization, um, most people say my child wants to go out and cycle in the road, but it's not safe. Um, the COVID pandemic obviously has placed limitations. Um, and actually, I think a basic lack of insight about how important it is. No one actually has thought about it. They just think their child needs to study. No one is thinking about their physical health, I think. I think that's the key barrier, and which can be addressed by education, hopefully. Thank you for that question. Uh, we have another very interesting um, lecture coming up. So that will be on novel dietary options uh, for the management of obesity. This will be conducted by Professor Sudhira Kalupahana, Professor in Human Nutrition at the Department of Physiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, <clears throat> let me thank uh, Dr. Chaminda Garusinga, uh, my good friend, batchmate, and the president of the uh, Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists for this uh, invitation, and also the secretary and the council. So, uh, so as uh, Dr. Udita Bulukahabiti mentioned, this year's theme for the World Obesity Day is that everybody needs to act. And uh, when I see the audience, I think the majority is female. So I thought I'll start with this picture. Okay. I should have included one of Ranil's pictures, but I couldn't find one. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, what I want to show here is that uh, there are certain trends over time. Now, initially, you can see the Elvis Presley, especially the hairstyle. Then, when we were children, and you know, maybe when Niranjana also might remember, Udita, he was Robin Hood, so he had hair like that. Then uh, I think that's David Beckham. Last guy, of course, I don't know whether he's handsome, but that's, I just want to show the hairstyle. So there are trends in, uh, you know, these hairstyles and the clothes and things. So similarly, there are trends in diets. About uh, one or two years ago, when every patient came to me, they said they were doing keto diet. A lot of doctors are calling and asking, what is this keto diet? So what is the fashion nowadays? Yes? A intermittent fasting, yes, see, you, you know the answer. <laughs> so then as the Time magazine asked, so what is intermittent fasting and is it actually good for you? In fact, this was good, new to me, it's not something I learned, okay? So uh, in the next, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so, we will uh, talk about these things, we'll talk about therapeutic weight loss, the steps we have to follow, and then the obesity management tools we have, and then I think Dr. Bulgabiti also mentioned this is a very important thing, the phases of a weight loss intervention. And then I'll give a brief overview of the dietary approaches we have for weight loss. And then we'll talk a little bit about intermittent fasting because everybody, you know, is following this or have questions on this. And then finally, as Professor Anil Jayadhan mentioned, the most important thing, the weight loss maintenance. Now repetition is not necessarily a bad thing. So I thought I'll repeat this. I think two previous speakers talked about this. You know, so we have the guideline from the endocrine college, you know, so take this message to the, you know, the other doctors and follow this. So, you know, the BMI cutoffs are very important because still we, we see there, are, there is no consensus among most of the doctors. So please, you know, follow these guidelines for the cutoffs of obesity. And as Dr. Bulugha mentioned, 
you don't need to achieve a normal bmi now this is another misconception most of the patients have so we have to dispel this myth at the first visit itself and say no you don't need to achieve a so called normal bmi we use the bmi to see whether the person is having obesity or not that's it there is nothing saying you need to achieve the normal bmi right so most of the illness i think dr bulga happy you mentioned this in detail so you need about 5 to 10% weight loss okay 5 to 10% of course for diabetes remission you probably need about 15% you know so but at least even 5% has a huge metabolic benefit so now what are the weight loss steps now let's say now we have listen to all the previous speakers you know we we have diagnosed obesity we know that it's a big problem so now the patient is with you okay so how are you going to start the most important thing you have to assess is the readiness to make lifestyle changes so if i now most of the time i get a couple or the child with the parents and so on so i will really see an individual patient so i ask them right so now who brought you here did you come willingly or did your wife bring you did your parents bring you and so on because if the client or the patient is not willing you are not going to succeed so you are wasting your time so assess the readiness to make lifestyle changes and then as i said the goal is to lose about 5 to 10% of baseline weight in 3 to 6 months how do you do it as all the speakers mentioned it's a team effort so comprehensive lifestyle intervention preferably with a trained interventionist or a nutrition professional this is what the guideline says so here again you know repetition but you can see these are the mainstays of obesity management tools the cornerstone is lifestyle modification and then in certain individuals we have pharmacotherapy and you know uh, bariatric surgery is extremely effective as dr bulga bit mentioned but only for a select few patients now i want to emphasize this because i see a lot of people now olistat is probably the only drug that we have license for weight loss in sri lanka as dr bulga bit said there are some very uh, promising drugs on the pipeline but we don't have that like for the routine use now you can see all is that is very effective for weight loss with coupled with lifestyle and here you can see you know compared to the placebo they have lost weight and then they switch groups when they stopped all is that they regained some weight when the placebo group switched on to all is that they lost weight but what i want to highlight is if you give all is that always give it with a low low, low fat diet otherwise you get nasty side effects you get fecal incontinence okay so you can get uh, spotting i once uh, encountered a girl who did not leave home for 2 months you know because she was having this uh, this uh, steatorrhea and incontinence so please if you are so this is a very effective drug but give it with a diet so now uh, about lifestyle modification i think we all know this so it has three arms so it's you have some dietary component you have to increase physical activity and then as dr bulga happy to mention behavior therapy is extremely important so you have to combine all three together now the nice guideline about lifestyle modification states these things we need to start behavior change strategies to increase physical activity and at the same time decrease inactivity i think professor aranjan karunanayak is an expert on this area he will deal about this in detail and then improving eating behavior and quality of diet so this is extremely important so rather than going on a diet it's important to eating improve improve the eating behaviors and the quality of the diets right and then of course to achieve weight loss at the end of the day you have to reduce the energy intake none of the others will work if you don't reduce the energy intake okay so how do we reduce the energy intake so that is i mean so how do we do this in terms of the diet so these are the current options we have right so the i would say the most aggressive method would be a very low calorie diet or a very low energy diet vlcds that is less than 800 calories per day 
by definition. And then, you know, most of the diets are reduced energy diets. That is about less than 1200 calories. Now, I see a lot of times, you know, when you teach students and, you know, when you look at lectures, you calculate the energy requirement, then you calculate the energy deficit. Doesn't work. I never do that. I generally go for a, about a 1,000 calorie diet for a female or a 1,200 calorie diet for a male. That's it. I mean, there's no point using, you know, using calculations to calculate the energy requirement and so on, all theoretical. Right. And then uh, you have the ones that I mentioned earlier, the ketogenic or the low-carbohydrate diets. Evidence-based, effective. Certain side effects are there, like increased LDL, but effective. And then we'll talk about intermittent fasting. All these will achieve reduced energy intake okay and then you know what we favor as medical professionals is the dietary patterns so follow a certain dietary pattern mediterranean diet has the best evidence dash diet and professor anil jayawardhan has done a very elegant study about the plate method which is the only dietary pattern we have studied for sri lankans so follow a dietary pattern so all these are effective in reducing the energy intake now, as Dr. Gulughapitya mentioned, this is something we need to understand, not only us, but also the patients. There are three phases in a weight loss intervention. So the initial phase is the one that we really know. Everybody is only concentrating on this, the active stage or the weight loss phase. So here we have all the different types of interventions, right? VLCDs, keto diets, intermittent fasting and then at some point you have the food reintroduction stage or the weight stabilization phase so you can't do a keto diet f you know forever no you can do it maximum three months okay intermittent fasting all the same so problem is once you stop this you gain weight so you need to transition into a healthy eating pattern and then the third phase is the weight loss maintenance phase which is as uh, Professor Anil and uh, Dr. Bulga Apite mentioned the most important phase otherwise I will guarantee they will regain weight within six to six months to one year. So remember these three phases if you are addressing a client you have to address all three phases so it's a pretty long follow-up. So just to uh, touch on the very low calorie diets, so as I mentioned, that is uh, by definition a calorie uh, less than 800 calories per day, a fairly intensive program, but you can do this in outpatient setting. Uh, now certain uh, trials like the diabetic, uh, the direct trial remission, diabetic remission trial, they use this. Uh, so the only thing is if you are putting a patient on a low, very low calorie diet, you can't do this just with the regular food because then they will be malnourished okay uh, one advantage of this method is that it will induce a certain amount of ketosis which will have a appetite suppression uh, effect now I, I i've never done total meal replacements i generally do two meal replacements with a single meal without any carbs so that's the plan that i generally do and I say, I mean, I don't have data, but this by clinical experience, they will only be hungry for three days. From the fourth day onwards, they will not be hungry. They can manage two meal replacements and a meal with vegetables and a protein. Okay, so that is because of this ketosis. So therefore, you need to use VLCD products, which come in the forms of shakes, bars, or soups. Okay, so these are evidence-based methods of uh, you know very low calorie diet and the evidence uh, comes uh, the most strong evidence comes from this direct trial uh, the diabetic uh, remission trial they use these total diet replacement so again remember they had three phases huh? so initial phase only they use the total diet replacements then they reintroduce food and in the maintenance phase it's only the regular food so you can see at the end of one year 45% of people with type 2 diabetes achieved remission. So they started the trial without any anti-diabetic. So they put off all the anti-diabetic drugs and put them on the diet. And at the end of one year, 45% had achieved remission. Now remember, this is not cure. Remission is not cure. So the diabetes is not cured. They should be followed up by the endocrinologist 
as regular because you know diabetes is not just about glycemic control okay and then you can see at the end of two years even still 35 percent maintain the remission so very effective reduced energy diets there are different types of diets high carbohydrate you know high carbohydrate low fat and then you have the uh, low carbohydrate high fat keto diets and then you have the sort of uh, in between kind of thing the zone diet and so on all are effective you can see different carbohydrate macronutrient contents all are effective as long as they are low in calories okay so all these are effective so now we will talk about intermittent fasting right now as i said uh, now this is a good uh, learning exercise for most of the young doctors here so if you want to find out about a new technique or a new drug or anything how would you go about it okay so first uh, what is this intermittent fasting so there are actually three main things so first one is what is called time restricted eating so in this particular plan they eat only for 8 hours per day for the rest of the 16 hours they don't eat anything so it's only time restricted not focusing on the things they eat okay now you can see uh, now if you look at uh, these two in parallel you can see buddhist monks they follow this very kind of similar thing because buddhist monks if they follow really the what you call the vikala bhojana silpada they are supposed to eat from sunset until noon so after that no calories they are allowed to drink certain things but without any calories okay and we know that in ramadan fasting there is time restricted fasting okay so that's the first type then you have uh, the the real you know what is called the alternate fasting so there's the five to diet so five days of the week they eat normally two days of the week they have a very low calorie diet about 500 calories or less then there is this alternate fasting so today you eat normally the next day you have the low calorie diet okay so this is actually all from literature you know so these are the three main things that are practiced so as i said earlier if you want to find out about a new drug or a new diet or anything one good place to start is by reading an expert review so i have a lot written a lot of expert reviews so professor anil jawadhan has written a lot of expert reviews so this is actually uh, so an expert is telling you about certain things so i found this nice article on new england journal of medicine our uh, the bible of medicine right so this is pretty new 2019 and they were very they are they pro, they were pretty like proponents of this uh, type of eating pattern they gave a lot of data nice data show these very effective very nice thing you know prolongs lifespan everything but i was shocked to see no clinical trials only basic animal studies okay it's fine i mean we even we write mechanistic reviews for clinical journals but uh, it can be very misleading okay then of course you have to look at the level of evidence you know so we know the levels of evidence so look at to see whether there are clinical trials well well designed randomized control trials i found a couple of ones in published in kind of the other thing is like when you can look at whether they are published in like pretty good journals right so this is actually in jama internal medicine pretty good journal two one first one is about alternate day fasting second one about time restricted eating conclusions did not produce superior weight loss is not more effective in weight loss than eating throughout the day not effective then what other levels of evidence can you see we can look at meta analysis okay so this is a meta analysis again uh, jama open pretty okay journal and this is what is called the umbrella review okay so they included 11 meta analysis com comprising 130 randomized control trials they only found one study so 1% of the studies supported by high quality evidence which also showed modified alternate day fasting for 1 to 2 months only 1 to 2 months moderate reduction in body weight so what can you see so we need actually good uh, meta analysis in area and i think professor anil jawardhan is a very good person to do this so we need some more good 
meta analysis of the area, but from what we have so far, nothing. Then another place where we can look for guidance is from professional organizations. If you want to look for an endocrine disorder, go for the endocrine guidelines. Okay. So uh, in the United States, the American Nutrition uh, Academy, uh, sorry, the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is a, uh, the main dietary guideline professional clinical organization. So what is their recommendation? I got this from their website. Intermittent fasting is not currently a recommended treatment for weight loss. Not only that, it may pose a health risk for certain individuals like people with diabetes, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding and individuals with a history of eating disorders and disordered eating. So I guess the message is clear. Right, uh, then finally, what are the other uh, ways to reduce energy intake, other dietary patterns? This is what we actually favor. So Mediterranean diet, you know, is the best evidence-based diet, you know, for weight loss, for diabetes remission in the long run, and as well as the only diet to show reduced cardiovascular disease risk. None of the other diets have shown reduced cardiovascular disease risk in the long term. So this is, uh, you know, the, 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 the major part of this diet is a, it's a fruit and vegetable based diet. They consume whole grains and then in terms of protein, they consume fish and seafood, less amount of poultry and least amount of red meat. But they do consume a lot of olive oil also and nuts and they use herbs and spices. We can easily follow this diet only with the exception of the olive oil, okay. And you can see the evidence, the diabetic remission, you know, they can achieve at the end of one year about 15%, which is pretty good. Over time it decreases, but still this is a significant uh, increase compared to the, uh, the, the typical low fat diet. So in terms of the Sri Lankan context, the easiest thing, now this is my mainstay in practice and you can see the evidence comes from Professor Anil Javadana studies, the plate method, okay, so half the plate as non-starch vegetables, quarter grains and quarter protein food. And not only this rice plate, I think Professor Anil Javadan has very nicely, uh, you know, published this. You can use this for other different types of meals as well. So plate method is a very imp like easy way to go about this. Cooking techniques are extremely important, right? So instead of deep frying or adding a lot of coconut milk, you can try to, you know, have salads and boiled vegetables, soups, grill, broil, cook with spices and so on. I think uh, Dr. Samudhu Saniratna also showed this. Sugar sweetened beverages are a big problem, especially, you know, the one on the bottom, especially among children and not only children, I think a lot of doctors, they use these things, okay. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, so people, people ask me, so okay, now how, what do I use for energy? Say, just drink coffee or tea. Just drink coffee or tea because this gives energy from caffeine. Okay, it has a lot of sugar also. Okay, so instead of this, go for tea or coffee. Then behavior therapy is extremely important. Okay, so things like stimulus control. If you have chocolates at home, you are going to eat it. So don't bring it home. Stimulus control. This guy at the bottom is a big problem. So I don't know how do you control the stimulus, maybe you'll have to assault the guy physically or threaten him saying don't come to our lane. I think all the time I tried to do that because I was so annoyed with that the sound. Assertiveness is something which we don't have, we lack. You know, if you give something, oh just eat, no, today only. So you say no. You should know how to say no. Everything in life, that is one of the most important things you should learn. You should learn how to say no. Friends, they open this large pack of rice, come, you know, we let's share. So, you say no, not doing that. Assertiveness, very important. Social support. This, I think in Sri Lanka, we need a lot of attention on this. Okay, we have a lot of negative comments for persons with weight loss. So, uh, if a person is following a eating pattern and then they are going to eat a piece of cake. If you go and say, why are you eating that? Aren't you on a diet? Is that a good thing to say? No, it's a negative comment. Okay. 
And then uh, if you say, I can't really tell you if you have lost weight. If you are on a diet, no, you look the same. Or else the other way, you say, why have you lost weight? Have you got diabetes? You look sick. <laughs> and then some people say, you were fine the way you were, no? Why are you like in single is Adilagil and so on? So social support is very important. And then another behavior technique, especially important in children, I think Samudu will agree with me, is operant reinforcement. You have to reward good behaviors. I think not only for weight loss, any behavior in children, if you want to change their behavior, you have to be positive rather than telling them not to do this, not to do that. You give positive comments, okay? So if you have lost weight, you know, you reward yourself with buying a nice, this what you call the activity watch or something. For a child, now I see we do a pediatric obesity clinic and you know, so it's nice to see the parents themselves, they do this. They say now he's very active. Now today we are going buying him a bicycle. So that is, you know, good reward for good behavior. And when you meet the patient, now especially nutrition professionals, I think about 90% of my time, my duty is to be a cheerleader. So when they come for the second visit, if they lose weight, 90% of the time I, what I do is encourage and say, now you've done very well, see you lost this amount of weight, done fantastic, you know, all positive. So that is operant reinforcement, so reward is very important. And then, uh, you know, finally about physical activity, I'm not going to talk about this, uh, Professor Aranjan will talk about this, so minimize sedentary time and uh, guidelines he will say, strength training is also very important. So strength training, not only for obesity management. So as you can see, Professor Anil Jayawardhan, so during COVID, if you do a lot of weight training, you can have not only manage obesity, but you can have a very nice, handsome body, okay? So, and finally, so how do you maintain weight? The million dollar question. Still, we don't have an answer yet. So probably with the weight loss drugs, especially the GLP-1 analogs, we will have some support in this. But for now, you know, meal replacements, anti-obesity drugs, and including a high protein diet. So having a lot of protein. And also, most important thing which I have not mentioned is the physical activity is important for weight loss maintenance. So ladies and gentlemen, to summarize, aim to achieve five to 10% weight loss for a therapeutic benefit. Lifestyle modification is essential in every patient. Energy restriction, however or the other, will achieve weight loss. Intermittent fasting is not superior to other weight loss methods. I would not recommend. And every weight loss program should transition into a weight loss maintenance program. Thank you very much. And this is the place I work, the beautiful University of Peradinia, a top five times, 500, top 500 university, the only times top 500 university in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that uh, wonderful lecture. And I'm pretty sure most it steered a lot of questions amongst us. And uh, there were quite a lot of practical tips that we can use in the local setup. So it's uh, time for a few questions before we break uh, for tea. Um, one or two we would encourage. Professor Kalupahana, may I start uh, first? Uh, quite a few of our patients, they themselves practice this intermittent fasting and come and tell you that I have lost a certain amount of weight. Uh, so the thing is like uh, when you follow them, uh, were they able to like maintain it or probably what is your experience on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So that, that is what I said. Now this is effective in the short term, like keto diets. Keto diets are very effective. So some, for some people, that may be better than a typical lifestyle modification. But this is only the active stage. So as you said, if they have lost weight, very good. You encourage. But then you have to say, okay, now we have to focus on how you maintain this weight. So for that, you can't do this forever. So go for healthy eating. So at some point, you have to go for healthy eating and physical activity. Because they can't continue this. And in my experience also, they have sometimes come and said, I did this, now I have regained my weight. In fact, I have uh, two of my patients who are uh, continuing it for now for the past two years. Uh, and, uh, you know, like uh, from our perspective that because of this uh, risk of nutritional deficiency, uh, they are taking nutritional supplements on, on, on their own. Uh, I just want to know whether this has been studied of a long-term practicing of this intermittent fasting. No, only animal studies are there. So uh, that's what I said. We don't have data for like, you know, uh, long term. 
So, uh, so that's why I said, you know, there can be a lot of safety concerns. So I would not recommend, you know, this method, you know, if you are doing, um, you have to do it, don't do more than three months, I mean. That's my recommendation. I, I would not give it to any patient, you know, but if they are doing, you know, after about three months, go for a healthy eating plan. A great question again. Actually, vegetarianism and vegan diets are the best diets in the world in terms of redu reducing uh, cardiovascular disease mortality, provided you do it the correct way. But the problem in Sri Lanka is, like if you ask for a vegetarian rice packet, they will remove the piece of fish and give it to you. <laughs> so our vegetarian diet, people tend to eat a lot of rice and a lot of vegetables covered with coconut milk. So no protein, very high in carbohydrates and fat. So that is why uh, your observation is there. I don't have evidence about it, but it's just from experience. So it's very difficult to be a vegetarian in Sri Lanka because vegetarians have to be very uh, selective about the food, the, the variety. For, so for vegetarians, like unlike what Ranil said, variety is a good thing because uh, you need to have adequate protein. So pulses for every meal. Dal, cowpea, cuddler, green gram, or soy for every meal. And then you have to consume, as the name says, you have to consume a lot of vegetables, not a lot of rice. And then prepare the vegetables with little, as little amount of coconut milk as possible. And then the different types of vegetables, you need to have green leaves, you know, you need to have the, the orange vegetables. So, so it's very challenging. But if you do it the correct way, very good. But my experience is a lot of people, you know, they gain weight because of the reasons I mentioned. Yes. Thank you for your Can you say that again? I didn't hear properly. Otherwise, vegetarian. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. Mediterranean, yes. What is your experience? Can you challenge us? Yeah, I mean, uh, there is no evidence about the Mediterranean diet in Sri Lanka, but I think, I think, like, the thing is, if you follow it 100%, you have to use the olive oil for that, because that is what the evidence has used. So it's very difficult to do that in Sri Lanka because of the costs, right? But I think, uh, you know, this is like uh, maybe uh, extrapolating a little bit, but I think you can follow the rest of it, you know. So Mediterranean diet, as I said, so it's very similar to the plate method in a way, because they consume a lot of vegetables and then fruits, then of course uh, fish, nuts, and, and we use a lot of spices. Okay, so uh, so so I, I would say you know if, if you can afford the olive oil, you know I would say because the evidence is there, go for it. But using it without the olive oil, we can't recommend it based on the evidence because we don't have evidence. But if you follow it the 100% that way, that is the best evidence we have. Because often in childhood, what I see is lots of, uh, when you take the plate method, a lot of children prefer to eat rice and dal. And they don't like the curries. But when you say, such as salads, so that's why I was thinking whether yeah, you know, exactly. that sort of uh, the fresh uh, kind of. Yeah, in, in, the, in the plate method, what we encourage is mostly salads and boiled vegetables. Because exactly. you have a rice cooker, you can easily prepare that, not the curries. So that, that is another thing. And I think one of the things in, with regards to ch the children we need to address is they are consuming four meals a day because of our interval time. So they sometimes consume breakfast and 10.30 they eat rice, they go home and eat rice and then the dinner, so four meals. So that is another problem with children. Yes. Absolutely. The best zero calorie drink is water. So that's excellent. But I, I know what you're asking about. So you have the what is called the non-caloric sweetness. 
again you know uh, i would not recommend them because one thing we don't have very long term data about their risk for cancer and things but another thing i think dr bulga pt will know this they have been shown to be endocrine activators so even though you don't uh, you know get calories they are shown to increase insulin secretion okay so i i, I would not recommend this and also like the idea of uh, idea is to reduce their cravings so so their craving for sweets can increase if you continue this so because of all these things i think i would advise uh, people even with diabetes you can use half a teaspoon of sugar with the tea okay not the sweetness that's my of course advice yes if i may ask uh, there are some favorites in the sri lankan diet just want to know what your opinion about them is Kolakanda, Kiribat, and Paul Sambole for you. Yeah, so uh, I'm sorry I didn't have time to go through the basics of nutrition. Now, generally what I tell you is whenever you are trying to analyze a particular food or a beverage, go by the food groups. So we have five food groups, grains, fruits, vegetables, protein foods, and dairy. So always ask yourself, what are the food groups? So if you take Kolakanda, you have grains, you don't have vegetables, you only have the extract, and that's it. And you have polkiri. so what are you basically taking you are taking grains with added oil so is it healthy no so no protein so kolakanda is not healthy what is the other one you say kiribat sorry kiribat kiribat okay so kiribat if you take the white rice what what are, what are you going to have you know just the grain and some polkiri and what are you going to eat it with lunumiris is there a protein no so mungata kiribat is a little bit better okay but kiribat in general just a grain and sambola sambola so it's not it doesn't fall into food group actually because it's not a vegetable not a fruit not a grain not a protein food and not dairy for sure it's oil it's oil exactly so it's so adding coconut you know sambola is like adding oil to your diet yes don't know if they have time two great questions so first one uh, uh, <coughs> so uh, frequent small meals so again you know there is no evidence to support that frequent small meals are better than maybe having two small two large meals but then for people with like diabetes for example to minimize the glycemic load we encourage three main meals and three healthy snacks in between okay but other than that what i said earlier it's a calorie total calories which count but then in terms of children especially having breakfast is important people children who don't have breakfast can be overweight as well as underweight okay so especially having breakfast is very important breakfast means you have to have it within 2 hours from waking up okay so in terms of that from you know anecdotal experience i would say three meals and two to three snacks is the way to go second one about the genetic predisposition absolutely we tend to gain a lot of trunkal fat and we we have a lean small lean mass anyway genetically and as ranil showed in that picture and then as you said our diet we consume lot of carbohydrates and less amount of protein i think both i have a combination have resulted in this low lean mass as well as increased abdominal fat deposition yes good afternoon everyone so the next lecture is the role of physical exercise in obesity prevention and let me invite professor aranjan karuna naik uh to deliver the talk oh i think it's good morning uh, it's good afternoon uh, i first take this opportunity to thank dr ten uh, good afternoon i'll first take this opportunity to thank dr chaminder and his team of endocrine endocrine society for inviting me for this lecture uh actually i met uh, chamin the i have spoken to chamin the over the phone but only thing uh, i met him only at the hospital but both of us were going to treat <laughs> were not to take treatment then when he told me that uh, to speak on this topic so i said uh, now physical exercise is definitely useful in 
reducing or prevention of obesity, as Sudhir, uh, Prof. Sudhir uh, and, and uh, others mentioned. But physical exercise, in addition to reducing obesity, it has several other benefits. So I told Chaminda that I'll speak about the benefits and certain types of physical exercises. And sometimes when you're doing physical exercise, you, you, you may sustain certain injuries. So you must know how to prevent those injuries also. Then only you'll enjoy doing physical exercise and get the proper benefits. So actually my lecture today, will, I will not show much research data. My, there's a reference list and all much charts, but uh, first in my lecture I will say first briefly say what obesity, but so many slides, uh, speakers spoke about obesity, so I will not talk about obesity that much. And then about the benefit of certain physical exercise, there are different types. And what are the advantages of different types of physical exercise? And then when you are doing certain physical exercises, what are the advantages you get and what are the objectives of a physical exercise program and if you have, if, uh, and what are the key things you should know when you are doing following a physical exercise program so that, that will be my uh, lecture so and after if there is time i'll give you some few demonstrations of physical exercise which you can do even while you are at your workplace right? so so obesity uh, you know, it's excess accumulation of body fat which can endanger the health, endanger the health. And um, there are different ways of, many ways of measuring your obesity, like your BMI, your waist to hip ratio, then your fat measurements. There are so many things. And um, now they say like BMI over 25 is overweight, 30 is obese. But now, the, according to the previous many speakers told that BMI over 25 can be considered as obese. So, uh, and the other thing with regard to the BMI, sometimes if you are a muscular person, sometimes your BMI can be high because of your increased bone weight and also muscle strength. Then the other thing, so uh, now with regard to uh, when you obesity, now sometimes when you have a very low BMI, definitely you must promote that. Sometimes. Uh, some patients come and say, as a sports and exercise, are you cannot achieve that. <laughs> Better to forget about these targets. So, actually, sometimes if you can go in a step by step, first get the BMI down to 25%, then after that, go for the, uh, the other things. Then I think then it's, uh, you must give a target which the patients can, people can achieve it. So the other thing in obesity is not only a cosmetic concern and there are many complications like from it can affect any system, CVS, respiratory and GIT, musculoskeletal problems, as sports visions, we treat many musculoskeletal problems. So we, obesity contributes to all those things, right? So I will not talk much about obesity because there are many causes for obesity like your physiological reasons are there, I think the environmental, then the genetics, all things, everything is there. Those things were nicely covered in previous lectures, so I will not talk about those, right? Then what is physical activity? Now, physical activity is when, when you are using joints and muscles and doing certain movements, it's, which requires energy is called physical activity. But a physical, act, physical exercise program is a, like, you, you, it, it has to be done on a regular basis. It, it is well structured, should be well structured, and it, get, it should cover certain objectives. The, that is what is called physical exercise program. Now, when you are talking about physical activity, there is a ways, way of classifying it, mild, moderate, and vigorous. There are many, uh, even to classify mild, moderate, and because there are, you can use VO2 max and things like that, but those are difficult when you are going to advise your patients and people who come to get advice. Now, the best thing is talk test, easiest thing to remember. Mild means when you are doing your physical activities, if you can sing, that means it's a mild type, right? Moderate intensity means that means you can, you cannot sing, but you can talk. Vigorous intensity exercises, you can't even talk, right? But sometimes a lot of people come and say, like, I do moderate intensity exercise for 30 minutes, but if you observe them, it's 
it's not moderate, it's mild. Right? So, you can ask yourself and say, when I'm exercising, whether it's mild, moderate or intensity based on your talk test. And uh, next is, uh, there are many ways of being physically active. The common, the lot of people, the, 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 com the common use method, even in Sri Lanka, the most popular method is walking. Because one is, you don't need uh, facilities for walking, you can find any, even on the pavement, you can walk. In certain research studies have shown, walking on the pavement is the most popular method. Right? The other, other one is cycling and sports activities also come into play. Now, athletes, they are involved in sports activities, but uh, next, cycling is an, another popular sport. Right? Now, your physical exercises can be performed during your recreation time and also do, while going to work, also you can make it, use, make it as an exercise. Sometimes if you are uh, certain distances, instead of going in the car, you can walk. walk. The next one is, when you are doing household activities also, you can do, keeping it in mind to achieve certain benefits, right? Like when you are exercising certain, now if you are using a screwdriver, then you are exercising your forearm muscles. If using a hammer, again, you are using your forearm and the arm muscles. So, your household activities also you can do it in a particular manner. Then occupation also. Now, sir, when you are doing occupation, now most people, even us, we are seated in one place for long hours. So, during occupation also, like if you are seated for a long time, maybe every 20, 20 to 30 minutes, you are supposed to get up for 5 minutes and do a little bit of stretches. And even um, in occupations, busy occupations, you can do certain strength training ac activities like your isometric exercises, which I'll teach you all, give a small demonstration, all of you all must be knowing, after my lecture, which you can do even while at work, right? Certain types of isometric exercises, that is to strengthen you. So, so physical activities, a lot of people say they don't, have, one commonest barrier is they say they don't, they don't have time. But you can find time, if you really want, you can find time. So, the, the benefits of physical exercises, again, previous lectures have spoken many benefits. Helps to prevent non-communicable diseases, pre prevents osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. Not Physical exercise benefits are not only reducing obesity. It has so many other benefits, physical, psychological and psychosocial. Once you start exercising, when you start feeling the benefits, then it becomes a habit of yours. Then, uh, then as a result, it will help in your obesity prevention also, right? The next thing is sometimes to get something to be, make it a habit. You have to do, motivate the person at least to do for three weeks. Then after that, after the three weeks or more, three weeks, you don't have to motivate that person. Once he feels the benefit, he will, he will follow that lifestyle, right? And uh, so these are the, some of the important benefits and um, as a result of the, one thing, you're cosmetically, when you are physical exercising and when your weight reduces and when you get a, when your muscle bulk increases and when you can do things faster, when you can lift things heavier, then you, your motivation improves and as a result of that, you will tend to do more, uh, you'll stick to that body, uh, stick to that lifestyle and then that will help in re reducing obesity. Now, physical exercise recommendations, like uh, earlier I think there's a pediatrician also here. I think um, from childhood onwards, like they say like even one to two year old children, there have to be at least physical, physical activity, about three hours of physical activities required. Right? And even three to four years, they say about three to four, about um, uh, three, uh, uh, 180 minutes of physical activity should, should, is recommended. Now, if you come to five, 5 to 17 years, they say at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical ex exercises. And uh, now, teenagers at least do, they, sh they should do about uh, 3 days of strength training. Even 2 days is fine, but 3 days is better. And 3 days is better. Now, now 18 to 64 years, I think the, 
they say what to what their recommendation is 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise for a week or 150 to 300 minutes of vigorous moderate moderate intensity exercise for a week but uh, again uh, like above 65 years also the same recommendation strength training is about two to three weeks but the problem is uh, now a lot of people in the world about 20 uh, 25% does not reach this target. Sometimes in, in certain countries, it may be even more. I'm not sure about Sri Lanka. I think even Sri Lanka, about 20 to 25% don't reach this target. Right? Now, sometimes to achieve certain benefits, you don't have to do so much of... Because sometimes you are doing the same exercise on a routine basis. Sometimes monotonous is there. Monotonous is there. So sometimes... Instead of doing 150 minutes of, uh, in a, if, if I, for a day, if you are doing 30 minutes of uh, like moderate intensity exercise, if you combine certain, uh, if you combine vigorous and moderate, you don't have to do 30 minutes. You can, you can, it can, it can be reduced. Sometimes, like interval, like diet, you get in, interval fasting. You get physical exercise also. There is something called interval training that you can. Combine vigorous and moderate, and then reduce the amount of exercise. Now, if you are going for a maybe like a walking or jogging, first first few minutes you can walk at a slower speed, gradually increase the speed, walking speed, and then after that you can start a little bit of jogging. Then again reduce the speed. Then like that you can alternate between walking and jogging. Then you can reduce the amount of time uh, you spend. That will reduce the monotonousness. So the next thing, the next other thing is sometimes to get certain uh, get benefits. Even six minutes of exercise for a day has shown to give some benefits. Like six minutes of exercise means it's a combination. It's a circuit training type of thing. Now British Air Force and Police UK Police Department and the Air Force they are following the six minute interval, six minute vigorous intensity uh, physical exercise routine. Even you, like 30 seconds of, if you say 30 seconds of jumping jacks exercises. Jumping jacks is a, you are exercising the arms, limbs, everything. It's 30 seconds. Then 30 seconds you can take a small break. Then you can do 30 seconds of spot jogging. That is at fast speed. And then again 30 seconds of break. Then you can do 30 seconds of half squats, not full squats. Because full squats sometimes can lead to patellofemoral problems. So 30 seconds of half squats. Then you are actually in that's cardiovascular type. At the same time, then you can do your little bit of for a 30 seconds. You can do push-ups as much as you can, dips if you call it dips, right? Then also you can do your the core strengthening exercise like your planks, abdominal crunches like 30 seconds, 30 seconds like that. Six minutes you can cover uh, many, um, but if you can do it at a vigorous intensity exercise, that is better. But if you are if you have not exercised for a long time, then you can start with moderate and gradually uh, within your capabilities. Even six minutes morning, six minutes evening is fine. So that might help in the time management also, right? So that, you know, certain Air Force and police officers who are in high ranking, they don't have time. So sometimes they follow the six minute exercise with, with some uh, radio guidance. They follow the six minute test. Sometimes when I don't have time also, I do the six minute physical exercise test. So that also can be tried and that also helps to show, that also has shown benefits, certain research has shown benefits, right? Next is, uh, now, aims of a physical exercise program. One is, it helps to improve your aerobic endu endurance. In aerobic endurance, like a, you can do certain moderate intensity activities for a long period of time. Then. Anaerobic and in the endurance is you can do a high intensity uh, ability to do high intensity activities for a particular period of time. Then speed endurance is you try to keep your maximum speed for a particular duration of time. Then strength endurance is like you should be able to do many repetitions. Like your if you take there's something called one repetitive maximum with regard to strength training. That is the amount that is the weight you can but in the Maximum weight you can do a one repetition. So if you can t take thirty percent of that and do ability to do many repetitions using thirty percent of 
one repetitive maximum is called your strength endurance. Next, your flexibility is ability to, to stretch your joints. So in a physical exercise program must cover all these areas, flexibility. Then proprioception, your joint position sense. Now, as a, when you are doing, not only for sports people, even for any person of any age, joint proprioceptive skills are important, especially elderly, that will help to prevent falls, right? So, pro, then next is plyometrics. Plyometrics are usually done for athletes and sports people. In plyometrics, what you do is you train to do your physical activities at high speed and power, like your punches, like those sort of things, high speed and power. Then sports specific skills, again, you do, your, you do the movements at high speed and power, but in an accurate manner to achieve certain aims of the sports. So some, uh, except the plyometrics and sports specific skills, all others can be included in our uh, physical exercise programs, but at least the aerobic endurance, uh, strength, strength, flexibility, proprioception, those things are very important for anyone. Right? Then benefits of endurance training. Now for weight reduction, they say in cardio uh, endurance exercises play a big role in uh, because in, uh, in addition to that weight reduction, they improves your cardiorespiratory endurance, then your neuromuscular coordination, and also helps to improve your blood sugar and blood lipid profiles. Now, not only endurance training, even strength training is also important in weight reduction. I think uh, Prof. Sudhira mentioned in his lecture also. So, uh, there are many ways of um, doing your endurance training exercises. One is, now the most popular type is your walking. Uh, so it's, sorry. Popular type is walking. Uh, now, a lot of people, now there are many walking tracks are in Colombo. Sometimes when you when you observe them, most of them are walking at very le in a leisurely manner. It's not you can't call it a brisk walking, but it's more. Um, if you look at them, it's like a mild intensity exercise compared to which should be moderate intensity exercise. Next is running. Is you now the walking is a popular exercise for weight reduction purposes. Out of cardiorespiratory endurance. Next popular the the popular method, um, popular technique uh, popular method is running, but when you are running, it has to you now this runner. Okay, uh, my pointer doesn't go that far. This runner is a heel strike runner. I told uh, Chaminda that I'll talk about certain injury prevention things also. It's a heel strike running is not is a less efficient way of running. Correct way of running is your forefoot. Run with your forefoot. Because you know. In a heel strike runner, it's biomechanically it is similar to walking. All stages are there. Only difference is there's a float phase. There's a float phase. So the injuries are more. You sp you are uh, running efficiency is less. Now our forefathers, when they were doing hunting, humans are supposed to be good endurance runners. They can keep up with wild animals. They have, those days they have, they have, they used to keep up with wild animals. Because they were good endurance runners. And they used to run with your four foot strike. Four foot strike, the faces, of, uh, faces are less. So that way you can preserve energy and you, you are, the foot tissues store more elastic energy. That also helps in improving our speed. So four foot running is the correct way, but because of our modern shoes, people run in the wrong way. Even children from childhood days, you must teach children how to run in the correct way. But with modern shoes, because of their shock absorption properties are great, you, you run in the wrong way. But even with the shoes, people develop certain injuries and they present to our clinics. Right? So you have to rectify the techniques. And next is you now cycling uh, is also another popular sport. But with regard to cycling also, you have to think of certain things like what is the terrain you are going to use, whether it's a 
maybe they, if it's a mountain terrain, then the, the cycle must be a different type. Now, if it's a if, if you are planning to go on a race, a racing bike, the uh, there the handle is turned inwards. That is to to cover or to to tackle the wind wind problem to get the the seats are higher. You bend forward and uh, that is to improve your speed, but it's not good for long distance cycling. So the cycle also, the type of cycle matters. Whether you are a recreational cyclist, whether you are a track and track at, track cyclist, whether you are a mountain cyclist. In a mountain cyclist, the weight of the cycle is less in the front, so you can lift it and maneuver. And sometimes they tend to stand while cycle while standing. So. To, for, to make the exercise interesting, you must have the proper equipment and the proper knowledge. Next is now in uh, the now with regard to physical exercise, there are things like personal barriers, environmental barriers, and social barriers. Personal barriers, the commonest thing is lack of time. Sometimes, if you have to go to a gymnasium or to a walking track, if you are while driving, it if it takes 30 to 40 minutes to get to that place, it's a deterrent. The other thing with in Sri Lankan research studies have shown the time factor is the one thing. Other thing, environmental barriers. A lot of people complain of rain because of rain. The outdoor activities are uh, they, they find they find it difficult to do outdoor activities. The next thing what they are complaining is when they are walking in the lanes or cycling, dogs come after you. <laughs> <laughs> the neighbors' dogs are outside and they, they come after you. So, those sort of things to prevent, those sort of things, sometimes to, for time management, getting a physical like, stationary bike might be useful while watching TV when you can exercise. And the cycle seat must be adjustable guys, the, to your height. Like, if the seat is too high, you will be straining your hamstring muscles. But if the seat is too low, you will be developing more strain on your patellofemoral joints. So, patellofemoral osteo people with patellofemoral osteoarthritis, the seat must be adjusted to a comfortable level. It should not be too low. So, uh, there are many ways of uh, tackling the time-related factors and making the exercise more enjoyable, right? So, these are the types of endurance training. Next is the very good exercise, swimming. And I think uh, it's a whole body exercise and also improves to strengthen your core muscles also. Uh, it's for good for upper limb, lower limb, everything. But um, the, the only issue with the swimming is sometimes you must have a good swimming pool. One is it should be safe and the water must be clean and, uh, uh, and, to, uh, so, and the other thing to get to a swimming pool is also a lot of time consuming. So, Although these and a lot of people sometimes they are not good swimmers, so they they will not be able to cover a lot of lengths. They might just get into the pool and walk up and down in the shallow end. Right? So that won't do give you the benefits of swimming, right? So so these are some of the endurance uh, exercises. Then with then with regard to strength training, strength training earlier belief was the cardio respiratory. Exercises are the best for weight reduction, but now they say even strength training is equal or even sometimes it can be better. But when you are doing strength training, you de develop your muscles. As a result of that, you can increase your resting metabolic rate. So, uh, even Prof. Sudhir also mentioned about strength training and with regard to weight reduction. So, uh, strength training, the other advantage is sometimes when you do strength training, you can help to maintain a good posture for long hours. Right? So, and in addition to that, lifting heavy, heavy things, those sort of things will also be uh, part of uh, strength training advantages. In addition to the other advantages of endurance training, there, there are different types of strength training, isotonic, isometric and isokinetic. I'll give some examples of isotonic, isometric and isokinetic later. And actually sometimes even you don't have to continuously do isotonic. You can sometimes alternate with isotonic and isometric. Right? But isokinetics are like you need a machine, you need a sophisticated machine, that is for athletes, but even Sri Lanka, we don't have much isokinetic machines. 
the next thing with regard to strength training, first you have to start with your low intensity activities and then gradually progress to high intensity activities and your intensity pro the progression should be about 10% for a week. Next thing is with regard to strength training is, now if you are lifting a, I am just giving an example like a, a say 10 pound weight and if you are used to do 12 repetitions into 3 sets, there are things called frequency, inten uh, intensity, duration and the, 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 the and the, the du uh, and the du uh, duration and the type. So, with regard to strength training, if you are doing ten repetitions, eight ten rep ten pound weight, maybe like uh, uh, nine uh, eight, uh, eight repetitions, three sets. Before you lift fifteen pounds, first you must be able to lift the ten uh, ten pound weight. You must be able to do for twelve repetitions into three sets. From eight repetitions, if you can do twelve repetitions into three sets comfortably then only you, you must think of lifting 15 repetitions. Otherwise, you might injure your muscles and injure your muscles. So, once you start lifting 15 pounds, you can't then do, do 12 repetitions. You might have to drop to 8 repetitions. 8 repetitions or even less than that. Right? And then gradually build up. So, slow, the gradual building up is important to prevent injuries. What happens if you develop an injury and if you don't adequately rehabilitate it, then people give up the exercise. Like if you develop the back pain or if you develop a muscle tear, then if you don't re adequately rehabilitate, they give up that exercise. So these are some of the practical difficulties which we see as sports and exercise physicians. Right? So, so important to avoid injuries. Next is, uh, I, I said I'll give some isotonic exercises. In isotonic exercises, what happens is the weight is constant, but the joint angle variation is more in isotonic exercises. So these are actually the one is for biceps curls. Other one is you are trying to train your, this lady is trying to exercise her hamstring muscles with the help of a trainer. Then next, uh, the next one is isometric exercises. Uh, this is a deadlift. The other one is trying to strengthen the quadriceps. In isometric, the, again the weight is constant, but the joint angle variation is less. That is the isometric exercises. In isometric exercises, when you're holding a position, you can hold minimum of six seconds. Sometimes it can go up to even thirty seconds. Right. So. Sometimes isometric, doing isometric exercises, you can even do do even without your without without equipment, which I'll demonstrate a little later after the exercise, after the lecture. Uh, and so isometric exercises sometimes it can give same benefits same, same benefits as your isotonic exercises. Next is isokinetic exercises. What happens is isokinetic exercises, your when, that's actually the, that when you are this particular movement when you are doing that happens at a constant speed, but the resistance is altered by the computer gen, computer operated machine. That now, if you want to improve your punching speed, kicking speed, those sort of things, isokinetic machines are important. But those sort of things are important for these athletes. But um, not many machines are available in Sri Lanka. Next is, uh, uh, now, isometric exercises are used in co-strengthening exercises. Now, in, what do you mean by co? Co is a rec like a rectangular shaped body cavity which is lined above by the diaphragm, below by, by your pelvic floor, on the, behind by your multifidus muscle in the spine. Then on the sides, you get the transverse abdominal muscles and in the front, the rectus abdominal muscles. So, this uh, the uh, pretty ladies doing the planks and uh, a lot of ladies in the audience also so um, they, they can try this exercise in this particular exercise you are strengthening not only your uh, not only your deep core muscles also your superficial core muscles like your gluteal muscles hamstring muscles then also your neck muscles you are trying to keep the neck straight that will strengthen your erectospinal muscles which are coming up to the cervical region. So, then also you are strengthening your upper limbs. 
but once you can do this comfortably then you can progress to the next one once your balance improves then you can do your another type of core strengthening exercises there are then there are again some easy ways of improving your core muscles which will be taught later next is about the flexibility training that is done to improve your joint range of movements not only improving your joint range of movements it also helps to improve your strength this flexibility exercises also help to prevent injuries but if you do it in the wrong way not it may uh, it might cause injuries also now different types of stretchers are there one is called the dynamic stretchers and the static stretchers and then there are things called ballistic stretchers then facilitate then facilitator stretching there things are there but uh, i'll talk about the dynamic static and the facilitator stretching Uh, because um, for um, ballistic stretching is important for sports people uh, now other thing with regard to stretching exercises first you have to warm up May maybe like uh, warm war without warming up if you try to stretch you can de develop certain uh, you can develop certain injuries like you can injuries your tendons you can injuries your ligaments so warming up is important and when you are stretching you must try to cover most of the our joints upper limb joints lower limb joints and also your trunk then uh, when you are holding the stretch you can also hold for about 60 to 30 seconds uh, so uh, those things those are some key points with regard to flexibility training and the other thing to prevent injuries you need to avoid sudden sudden movements to prevent injuries now when you are stretching you must not let somebody suddenly come and push you now i have seen in some gym instructors sometimes when you are trying to stretch your hamstrings they come and push you from behind so those sort of things can be dangerous now what do you mean by uh, the, the dynamic stretches usually dynamic stretches are done dynamic stretches are done before the before the particular sporting activity or before your main physical activity that mimics the main physical activity so that is so the first one is the, the dynamic stretches then static stretches can be done after your after your physical activity program during your cooling down program now when you are doing these stretches if you have sustain an injury you have to do it in a different way now this lady is doing trying to stretch her quadriceps but if you have sustain a if she if she is saying a back pain she she cannot do the she cannot do it standing so she might have to lie lie to a side and then do the quadriceps stretching of the quadriceps so these are some when you are injured you have to modify the way you stretch because sometimes what happens is if you if your injuries become bad people give up the physical exercise program and this is a type of uh, facilitator stretching in facilitator stretching what you do is with the help you first try to stretch the particular joint to a pain no pain junction then after you stay for 30 seconds in that position with the help of a, another person you try to st slightly stretch and hold that position for 6 seconds and then relax this will help to improve your joint range and joint range of movement you must avoid sudden jerky stretches right then next is proprioceptive training it is important for pe people of any age especially it helps to prevent falls and proprioceptive exercises also you have to do at least 3 days of the week you have again you have to start with easy exercises like standing with single leg is a easy exercise then there are things like wobble boards like you get a uniaxial wobble board and multiaxial wobble boards are there then other thing now soldiers have now if you take soldiers sometimes they they, they are trained to run on tires sometimes they are trained to run on moving logs so so the first again you have to start with easy ones and then progress into difficult ones people who cons constantly complain of uh, ankle li ankle ligament injuries they need to develop their proprioceptive skills 
that will help to prevent ankle injuries. And sometimes after injuries also your proprioception is affected, but to pre prevent injuries, proprioception is important. For elderly people, to prevent falls, proprioception is important. So these are some of the proprioceptive exercises. Uh, standing on a log and other one is a wobble board. So uh, the, uh, these are some of the proprioceptive exercises. Then next is, I think, plyometric, uh, plyometric and sports specific exercises. I said th these are especially useful for athletes, but even other people, by doing plyometrics, you can improve your strength and speed. So if you can do that, that is fine. Now, to do plyometric exercises, your joint range of movement must be almost normal. You can't have, uh, to, uh, you must have full joint range of movement and your strength must be at least 90% of your pre-injury level. Then sports specific skill skills also, your joint uh, range of movement must be normal and your strength must be near 90%. No and uh, sports specific skills must mimic the type of sporting activities, like a rugger ride should be able to ride, uh, run in a zigzag manner, like a martial arts person, he should be able to do the roundhouse type of kicking, those sort of things. So those are sports specific skills. And so you now keeping the legs together and jumping may even one foot may on, uh, over a one foot tall stool is also a tough task. Then other one is the uh, some sports specific exercises which uh, helps to run, um, uh, improve your sport, like even rugger rights, they can, these sort of exercises are important. So, then some, uh, before I wind up, there are some uh, principles you must note uh, with regard to physical exercises that will make your physical exercise more enjoyable and get, help to get benefits without sustaining injuries. Next is one, if you have not done physical exercise for a long time, and if you are a middle-aged person, better to get a health checkup by a doctor. Next, if you have any, if you while performing your physical exercises, if you sustain a particular injury, may like a tendon strain or a lig ligamental strain, it's it, you can follow the police regime. Police regime means protection, P is for protection. You have to first stop the aggravating factor. OL is for optimum loading. No, you don't need complete bed rest. That, that is called OL is for optimum loading. Then you can do your ice treatment. Then you can sub compress the particular area and ele elevate depending on the position. If you treat an injury early, it's, you recover faster. Then you can get back to your physical exercise training faster. Then if you have sustained any injuries, before you go back to your physical training or following physical exercises, you need to fully rehabilitate the injuries. And in the rehabilitation, if your, if your muscles are like, if certain leg, leg muscles, if one side is well developed than the other side, then less developed side has more chance of developing injuries. So you have to correct those errors. Other thing with regard to physical exercise, you must know what are the contraindications and the warning signs. Now, if somebody is having fever, that person should not do physical exercise because you are more risk of de developing carditis. Next is if you are suffering from diarrhea or dehydration, again, those are not, you should not exercise. First, you have to be properly treated. Because sometimes you are dehydrated, you are more at risk of developing heat related injuries. Next, warning signs are like when you are exercising after a long time, if you are developing a lot of severe headaches, chest pains, severe breathing difficulties, faintishness, those are like warning signs which you need to be investigated. And when you are advising your patients, people who are going for physical exercises, you need to advise them accordingly. Next, avoid training errors. Some training errors are like even applies to physical exercises. One training error is doing too much too soon. Gradual progression, I think, uh, I think Sudhira also I think mentioned the gradual progression is important. Other one is like, now certain training areas like you must not stretch without warming up. 
Next is like if you are used to running the physical exercise surface, like if you are used to running on a ground, maybe like two kilometers, if you try to run the same distance suddenly on a road, you will get injuries. So then of course you must not run the same distance. You have to gradually build up. Right? And correct technique of stretching, even running, if you, you must run, learn how to run in the correct technique. So avoid training errors is important. Next, you must, have the, you must know the correct footwear and proper clothing. Like now if, in a warm, very warm environment, if you are wearing a blazer and running, that is not uh, appropriate, right? But if you are in a uh, very cold environment, if you are not taking adequate pre prevent, uh, wearing the proper clothing, you can get heat related uh, heat and uh, you might be uh, sustaining injuries due to extremes of temperature. Next is avoiding dehydration is also important. You must advise about the fluid intake like at least two hours before, just before the physical exercise and during a one hour break, physical exercise break, fluid intake. Next, proper nutrition intake. And with regard to physical exercise and the, new, uh, the uh, meals, they say like if you are, before the event, at least if you are taking the main meal, you take at least three hours before the main meal. Otherwise, what happens is the gastric emptying, if, if you have not properly the gastric, otherwise the, the, there will be some discomfort and there is risk of vomiting and things like that. And after the physical exercise, you can take your main meal at least within two hours you must take the main meal. Then sometimes certain finding a proper partner that will motivate you to exercise. So, uh, today my lecture objective is not only obesity prevention, one is to give some idea about the certain physical exercises, you know, what to say with regard to certain patients, what advices are important. And um, if they follow this particular advice, they'll be able to achieve the benefits of physical exercise and avoid any injuries. Right? So, uh, the, uh, so the, uh, these are the, so uh, these are some of the references. Uh, I thought I'll just do some, uh, give some, iso what are the types of isometric exercises which anybody can do, like for upper limbs, like one is. So uh, the next uh, lecture in this session uh, is on the pharmacological management of obesity. It will be delivered by Dr. Kavinga Gunavardhan, a consultant endocrinologist at the District General Hospital, Nigambo. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank the College of Endocrinologists for giving me this opportunity. And without any further ado, over the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'll be talking to you on the medical management of obesity. Uh, we've had a very elaborate day on uh, management of obesity. And uh, during the next 20 minutes, I'll be talking to you about the rationale for pharmacological treatment of obesity. Where does it stand? in the management of obesity with diet, with exercise, with all these lectures you've had in the morning, where does pharmacology stand? So for that, I'll be touching on the pathophysiology of hunger and satiety very quickly, and the mechanisms of action on, of these pharmacological agents. Uh, I'll be talking to you about the weight loss molecules, and of course, uh, right at the end, I'll talk to you about the patient-centered molecular selection. Even if you're treating for another condition, probably diabetes, epilepsy, certain neurological conditions, when you select your molecules, you can pick and choose your molecules depending on your patient's weight and your requirements. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to sound like a bit of like a pharmacology lecture, so bear with me. Um, so since morning, we've heard of the importance of losing weight. Even a weight loss of about 3 to 5 percent of your initial body weight can reduce your obesity-related risk factors. So it is very important. Even losing a tiny bit of weight from your initial body weight can reduce your risk factors. So where do these molecules stand? Where does the pharmacology stand in treating obesity? Uh, as reiterated before by our uh, elite speakers, when you uh, get into a behavioral modification, when you restrict your calorie intake or reduce your diet, there are adaptive biological responses in the body. And what happens? The first thing is your energy, energy expenditure drops. And this, in fact, is out of proportion to the reduction in the body mass. So even if you lose a small amount of weight, your energy expenditure will drop more drastically. 
The second thing is your appetite. So when you start losing weight, your appetite goes up and I will tell you why. And this is where the pharmacology comes in. This is where the drugs can help you because this is an in impulse that is very hard to fight, appetite. Right, so weight loss medications will most likely affect this appetite. It will increase your satiety and decrease the hunger. And there are, there's just one molecule that will actually reduce your caloric absorption. Just a quick look at uh, the appetite, because I'm going to talk a lot about reducing appetite. So this is your uh, hunger center. This is arcuate nucleus. You'll be hearing a lot about it. And uh, certain messages will be sent to your arcuate nucleus from your gut. Dr. Bulgapite mentioned about this, from your gut, from your stomach, and from your adipose tissue. And when you eat food, there are certain gut hormones, most of them are anorexogenic. They will induce satiety. Peptide YY is secreted from the hindgut, CCK from the duodenum, gastric inhibitor polypeptide from the duodenum and the jejunum, GLP-1, we'll be talking about this in a little bit more detail, from the L cells of the ileum. So all these are gut hormones which will cause anorexia or satiety. And adipose tissues will secrete leptin. These two causes anorexia and ghrelin is an orexogenic. It will cause hunger and it is secreted by the stomach. So these molecules, there are a lot of new molecules which are coming out of this and we can perhaps have a chat about it at the end. And what are these weight loss molecules and how do they affect these appetite mechanisms at the arcuate nucleus? So most of these molecules, there are five FDA approved molecules and of that Four of them actually work on this arcuate nucleus working on the POMC neurons. That is where the satiety center is. And if I can just mention the molecules, uh, I'll reiterate a little bit later. Um, two of them are combinations, if you can remember them, phentermine and topiramate. Phentermine is a noradrenergic, dopaminergic, sympathomimetic amine. And topiramate is a well-known drug. It's an anti-epileptic medication. Uh, so they will also act on this arcuate nucleus. The second molecule, again a combination, bupropion and naltrexone. Bupropion is a dopamine, no epinephrine, reuptake inhibitor. Uh, my psychiatric colleagues will know this molecule. It is used at an antidepressant. Naltrexone will potentiate. So this is the second molecule. The third and the fourth molecules are GLP-1 analogs. Uh, endocrinologists are familiar with this molecule. These molecules are used in diabetes mellitus, liraglutide, and semaglutide. So these, for diabetes, they actually increase your insulin secretion. However, for obesity, they will act again on that arcuate nucleus, on the hunger center, to reduce your appetite. The last molecule, which does not affect your hunger really, is Orlistat, freely available in Sri Lanka. It blocks the absorption of fatty calories by about 25 to 30% in the gut. Right, just so that you remember this a little bit more in detail, this is your hunger center. So these are your anorexogenic pathways and this is your orexogenic pathway. So where do these molecules fall? This is the phentermine acting on the dopaminergic nerve, stimulating the anorexic pathway. This is the topiramate, acting on the GABA, working on the anorexogenic pathway, naltrexone, same way, uh, bipropion, again working the same way, GLP-1 analogs, working in the dorsal vagal uh, center, again stimulating the anorexogenic signal. So all these molecules will act on the arcuate nucleus stimulating your anorexigenic signal. So that is how these molecules will work. So before we go into further details, please do bear in mind these medications act to amplify the effect of behavioral changes in consuming fewer calories. They do not work on their own. So if you just put your patients on these molecules and do not change their behavior on consuming fewer calories, 
increase in their energy expenditure by emphasizing on ex exercise, they will not work on their own. So emphasize on lifestyle changes. And of course, these molecules will not change the underlying pathophysiology of weight regulation in any permanent way. So the moment you stop these medications, you will regain that weight. So it's not a permanent change. It is an augmentation of this process of weight loss. When are we going to use pharmacotherapy in weight loss? The BMI. Remember now, 27. If your BMI is more than 27, and if you carry a comorbidity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, or obstructive sleep apnea, there's an indication to start these molecules. And if your BMI is more than 30, it is recommended you can directly start this pharmacotherapy, provided the patients have been already started on behavior modifications. Right, let's take you through one by one. The first molecule available to us in many brands Olistat, approved by the FDA. Please look at the FDA approval for weight loss molecules. There'll be so many weight loss molecules coming to you. People will come and promote all kinds of weight loss molecules to you. Make sure they're FDA approved. And this was approved in 1999. The activity occurs in the stomach and the small intestine. It decreases your fat absorption by inhibiting the lipase in your intestines. So basically it blocks the absorption it blocks the digestion and therefore the absorption of fat by well, about 25 to 30% and therefore the fat is excreted in your stools which of course gives the horrible side effects. There is no appreciable systemic absorption. So the systemic side effects are hardly. You must advise your patients to take Olistat during or within one hour of consuming the meal. And it has been approved for the use of adolescents as well. Right, there are several randomized clinical trials. In fact, there are nine large randomized clinical trials to show that Olistat helps compared to placebo. And uh, this was an 18-month trial to show that it actually helps with the long-term maintenance as well. So it is of proven efficacy, even long-term. But the GI side effects are very, very common. There's a lot of oily spotting, flatulence, fecal urgency, and incontinence. And as Dr. Uh, Professor Kalupahana mentioned, you have to make sure your patient consumes a very low-fat diet to minimize these side effects. The dosage is 120 milligrams three times a day. Uh, and especially if you're going to consume a very fatty meal, uh, better to uh, take your Olistat on that day. Patients should, uh, should be advised to take a nutritionally balanced diet, and, uh, and they should be given a multivitamin. Especially fat-soluble vitamins should be included, vitamin A, D, E, and K, and they should be taken two hours away from after, con after or before consuming your tablets. Uh, it is contraindicated in pregnancy and in lactating ladies, and as well as in chronic malabsorptive diseases, so try to avoid that. Uh, so this is a drug that is available to you, so when you're using it, try to use it rationally. Right, the second molecule, quizmia, so this is a combination again, fentramine and topiramate. I put the picture here so that you know it's a combination drug and you get in different strengths. It's low-dose fentramine and extended release topiramate. It has uh, for proven benefits in weight loss, about 8 to 10 percent compared to the placebos. Unfortunately, it's not available to us as in a combination, however, topiramate is available. There are two major uh, double-blind randomized trials, the CONQUER and the EQUIP trial. Uh, the EQUIP trial was a randomized double-blind trial just on obese patients, and the CONQUER trial was for obese patients with significant comorbidities. And this is the first and the second trials. If you just look at the more than 10% weight loss, both trial studies show more than 10% weight loss of about 48%. So that is a significant weight loss uh, with the molecule. So how do we start this? I mean, if it is going to get registered in Sri Lanka and if it is going to be available, it's going to be very popular. So might as well know how to start it and proceed with it. You start at a low dose of 3.75 of fentramine, go up to 
uh, you go up to 14 days and then you can increase the dose to 7.5. So you have different strength molecules available to you. Start at a low dose, bring it up, and then for three months you continue. At three months, if you see a good weight loss, a 3% weight loss of the basal weight, then you can continue. If not, you can, con you can escalate. There are stronger molecules. You can go up to 11.5 and then go to the maximum strength of 15 milligrams of fentramine and 92 milligrams of topiramate. That is quite a high dose, and that is the highest you can go. It's once daily in the morning, and very important to know, you have to tail it off. There is topiramate in the molecule, and if you suddenly stop it, it can induce a seizure. Right, and there, there are trials to show that you can continue this for two years for the maintenance of weight. There are quite a lot of side effects. These are neurolo they, they can give rise to a lot of neurological side effects, paresthesia, dry mouth, constipation, uh, upper respiratory infections like symptoms, uh, and so on. Less commonly, it can give rise to suicidal behavior and ideation as well as insomnia. Contraindications, anxiety, if the patient has a history of heart disease, uncontrolled hypertension, seizures, if the patients are on antidepressants, pregnancy, lactation, hypothyroidism. So there are quite a lot of contraindications. Again, the message is, you're starting on something, please have a look at the profile. Right, because I'm talking about the side effects, I want to mention this molecule. This has been FDA approved, but the approval was withdrawn. So just because one thing is approved, make sure it's not withdrawn as well. So this is what happens to weight loss molecules, which is why one should be very aware. So locasterin, I'm not gonna talk in detail about it. Just know that it was approved in the early uh, 2000s, and then the approval was withdrawn in 2020 because of the potential risk of uh, malignancies. Right, the third molecule, bupropion and naltrexone. It is again a combination. So what is interesting about these molecules are none of these people actually looked at the gut hormones that we talked about and studied them. These were molecules that were used for other indications, for depression, for other psychiatric problems, and then they saw, just like sildenafil, they saw there are other benefits, there are weight loss benefits, and then they were studied. So that's why these molecules are there. Uh, very few molecules were purely studied for the purpose of weight loss. So this is again an extended release tablet. Bupropion is a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Again, acts on your hypothalamus, activating the pro-opio-melanocortin, the POMC neurons. Naltraxone is an opioid receptor antagonist. It inhibits the appetite-enhancing effect of beta endorphin. So together, when you put it together, there's a synergistic effect. Again, FDA approved in 2014, still carrying the FDA approval. Uh, the combinations are in 90 of bupropion and 8 milligrams of naltrexone. You start with once daily. You can increase it to BD and then two tablets BD. That is the maximum. Uh, you have to be very careful not to start them uh, until the patient is off a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, especially if the patient is on antidepressants. Right, let's talk about something that we might have access to, the GLP-1 analogs. So these are, again, molecules that are used for diabetes mellitus. GLP-1 analogs are secreted by the L cells of the ileum, and uh, these stimulate your pancreas to produce more insulin. So this is a treatment for diabetes. And then when they were actually doing trials, they realized the patients were starting to lose weight. And this is how these molecules were further developed. So this is glucagon-like peptide 1 agonists. Uh, they work by increasing the insulin, and also they work on the pro melanocortin neurons to reduce the appetite. They reduce the appetite, but they do not increase your energy expenditure. There are two molecules. The first one is Saxenda. It is actually liraglutide. Liraglutide is used for diabetes, but uh, it can only go up to 1.8 milligrams, but Saxenda can go up to 3 milligrams to a much higher dose for the weight loss purposes. So it was uh, branded in a different name. And the second molecule is semaglutide, very recently approved last year, uh, Vigovia. So both again FDA approved. 
so many trials to show that they are both very beneficial for weight loss. Saxenda has a whole series of trials called the, called the SCALE trials showing so this is the placebo, and this is basically, they're showing uh, exercise, just liraglutide, liraglutide and exercise. So basically, you will lose uh, with lifestyle modifications, you will lose with liraglutide, but if you combine them, the weight loss is extremely significant. How do we start uh, Saxenda? You start with a 0.6 milligram subcutaneous. It comes in a pen device. I'll show you the device. This is your pen device. So when you turn it, like your insulin pens, it gives you 0.6. So that is your first, first uh, turn. So it's a 0.6 milligram subcutaneous uh, daily for the first week. Then you can increase by 0.6 uh, each week uh, interval and then go up to three milligrams for a day. Uh, you cannot use this in pregnancy. There is a boxed warning for medullary C cell uh, malignancies. It has been shown in rodents, although there are no studies for humans, you have to have a caution. So take a history of medullary thyroid C or a family history of medullary CA thyroid and best to avoid that. And if there's a history of pancreatitis, avoid it. And for Saxenda only, with this high dose, you can have an increase in heart rate and again, suicidal ideations. Right, what about the new kid on the block, the semaglutide? This is how it is delivered. You get a single dose pre-filled pen. So it is just single dose, you inject it, and it is once a week. You inject it, you discard your pen. You inject it again the next week, you discard. So it's once a week subcutaneous. Uh, same day each week, you start with 0.25, and then you can go up every four weeks, all the way up to 2.5 milligrams and that is your maintenance dose. Again, several studies showing a weight loss of all the way to, from the baseline to about 15.6%, the uh, average about 14.9, and about 20% weight loss in, uh, compared to placebo. Right, it, because these are new molecules, please know your side effect profile. Again, in GLP-1 analogs, medullary CA thyroids, pancreas, and gallbladder disease. If your patient is having diabetes, if the patient is on a secretagogue like sulfonylureas or insulin, this can cause hypoglycemia. This can worsen your retinopathy, so be aware. Again, increase in the heart rate and suicidal behaviors and ideation. Right, so these are the molecules. I hope I wasn't too fast. Those are the five molecules that are already FDA approved. So when you start your patients on these molecules, look at them, make sure their behavior, their diet, their exercises are being followed. Otherwise you're going to have a failure in your hands. And at three months, if your patient has not lost more than 5% of the initial body weight, you have to stop it. And if they have, then you can continue. Right, right, just to finish up, patient-centered molecular selection. So this is where we talk about uh, when we want to start your patients on anything, an anti-migraine drug, an anti-diabetic drug, how can we select our molecules? Because all these molecules will carry a weight loss or a weight gain side effect. For example, in epilepsy, if you want your patient to lose weight, if you have an obese patient, try to pick on a molecule that can help you lose some weight. For example, topiramate. And be aware of molecules that will make you gain weight, like gabapentin, pregabalin, valproic acid, vigabatrin, carbamazepine. You might have to start it, but be aware of it. Or you can select a weight neutral molecule, like lamotrigine, phenytoin, and so on. Migraine, a very common situation. If you have an obese patient, you'd rather start them on a topiramate than fluoracin. Antidepressants. Unfortunately, most of these molecules will cause weight gain, but if you want, you can start on something like bupropion or even fluoxetine or sertraline, which will initially cause some weight loss, but then be weight neutral, or even imipramine, citalopram or acetalopram, which will be mostly weight neutral, rather than something like amitriptyline, mertesapine, venelaflexin, or duloxetine, which will cause a weight gain. I know it's a lot of names, 
but if you're familiar with them, it's easy to remember. Antipsychotics. There are typical and atypical antipsychotics. The atypical or the second generation ones are the ones, although they have less side effects with the extrapyramidal type, they will cause a lot of weight gain. It is well known. Uh, the notorious one is olanzapine, where about 30% of your patients will gain weight. Uh, the least weight gain is seen in aripiprazole, uh, and this is uh, the number of uh, the, the percentage that you will see, resperidone, catiapine. All of these will cause, but the percentages are a little bit less. What about diabetes, my territory? So there are certain molecules that you can use if your patient is obese. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, and of course the GLP-1 analogs. They will help you or your patient to lose weight. The DPP-4 inhibitors, that is the citagliptines, the linagliptines, and the bildagliptines, as well as metformin, they are known to be weight neutral, so they will not make your patient gain weight. However, insulin secretagogues like sulfonylureas, uh, pyoglitazone, as well as insulin, will make you gain weight. So pick your molecule looking at your patient's weight when you start patients on diabetes. In fact, uh, the American Diabetes Association has changed their molecular selection where this, I'll, I'm sorry, I'm sure you can't see this. So the first line is metformin. You start all of them are metformin, but then you look at your patient. If your patient has cardiovascular or renal disease, the molecular selection is totally different. If your patient has a hypoglycemic risk, your molecular selection is different. But if your patient is obese, you don't just pick your second molecule, just what is available. You pick your second molecule that will help the patient lose some weight. And those two molecules are the GLP-1 analogs and the SGLT2s. Those will help your patient to lose weight. So after metformin, go for this. And this is called patient-centered molecular selection. And if you have to start your patient on insulin, we know the patient is going to gain some weight, you mitigate it with another molecule that will help the patient lose weight. So you're giving insulin, but you're trying to give something to lose weight also. And always start with the basal insulin rather than starting with a pre-mixed straight away that has been shown to make the patient gain weight a little slower. Right, the last bits, contraceptives. It's another area where patients say, will I put on weight if I start on this? And they don't like to. So if you want to start, start them on oral contraceptives rather than injectables. Injectables have been shown to, uh, shown to be associated with obesity rather than the combinations. However, there's a lot of doubt about the combination pills because the combinations are so varied. There are a lot of types of estrogens, a lot of strengths of estrogen, different types of progesterone. So some will make you gain weight, some will not make you gain weight. So uh, the oral idea is there's no evidence to show the, oral combi the combined oral contraceptive pill may will make you gain weight. However, the injectables will. The antiretroviral, just to finish off, it is notorious to be associated with increasing deposition of visceral adiposity and lipodystrophy. So there is unavoidable weight gain in your patients who are on antiretrovirals. So be aware of obesity in your patients and monitor. So ladies and gentlemen, finally in summary, I've talked about the rationale of pharmacological therapy, the pathophysiology of hunger and satiety, the mechanisms of actions of these molecules. I've taken you through the molecules that are already approved, Olistat, Fentaramine Topiramate, Bipropion, Naltraxone, the two GLP-1 analogs. Then I've talked about the patient-centered molecular selection in epilepsy, in migraine, in uh, depression, in picking an antipsychotic, in diabetes, and contraception. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kavinga, for that excellent talk on oral medications in uh, managing uh, obesity. I'm sure she'll be happy to answer your questions. And uh, 
Yeah, what is the, uh, I like, you know, if, if the patient lose weight, but if you have the suicidal ideation and put it into action, there will be 100% weight loss, but that won't, <laughs> that won't be effective. True, true. Right. So therefore, uh, what, is the, what is the sort of ways to, is there any way that you can combine it with antidepressant or? How to mitigate that? So basically, because I came up with this uh, several times, I had a chat with my uh, psychiatric colleagues. So what most of these molecules do is they stop, they actually inhibit your reward pathway. So you don't feel the reward of losing weight. It's actually impaired. So you're, you're gaining something, you're, you, you're losing weight, you're doing something positive, though your reward pathway has been inhibited by the molecules. So if you if you are just doing your behavioral therapy, you won't have this. You will be you will feel high. You will feel good about losing weight, but if you add a molecule, you might not feel that good about losing weight, and therefore uh, there is a bit of depression or uh, you know that that rewardness is that, that feeling of reward is not there because you have actually blocked that pathway of reward. So that is perhaps one explanation. And uh, there is no background to start on an antidepressant, unfortunately, for these patients to stop that. There are, there's no increased risk of suicide. I looked it up so that, you know, there's no risk of suicide. It's a suicidal ideation. Any more questions? Can we combine the medication, other medications with fluoxetine? I suppose it does reduce your weight initially for the first three to four months, and then it is a weight neutral molecule. So yes, that is, that is perhaps uh, something you can use. Can all is that be taken as a one-time? Definitely, drug? yes. You can just take it before a wedding and eat and come back and forget about it. Yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> because it's a very localized uh, type okay. of an action. Yes, you okay. can. You might not see the obvious weight benefits, right. but you're going to lose the fat, 25% of the fat that you've consumed. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure if you have any more questions, you can ask during the lunch time. I'm sure, sure that you'll be happy to answer. And thank you very much coming on behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists for that excellent talk. It gives me, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Professor Ishan Saiza, MBBS Colombo, MS Colombo, FRCS Edinburgh and FRCS England. He's a merit professor in surgery in the Department of Surgery in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. And he has a vast experience in uh, performing bariatric surgery uh, over the last several years, so uh, so he's uh, uh, <coughs> so he's going to talk about the role of uh, bariatric surgery in the management of obesity. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank the College of Endocrinologists for inviting me to give this talk on World Obesity Day. Speaking at the end of a long session and just before lunch, I almost feel like the last husband of Elizabeth Taylor, but like, <laughs> but as Elizabeth Taylor would have said to all her husbands, I won't keep you for too long. <laughs> now, as highlighted by the previous speakers, the mainstay of treatment for morbid obesity is diet, exercise, and also medications. And surgery is, uh, is for patients where everything else has failed and uh, that is usually surgeries like that, right? The highest court of appeal. Right. So which brings us to the point, what is uh, morbid obesity? There is general agreement that obesity is uh, excessive uh, body fat. But usually, it is defined in terms of BMIs. And generally, BMIs over 35 are considered to be uh, BMIs associated with morbid obesity. 
Now, traditionally, it was believed that surgery should be done for patients with a BMI of over 40 without comorbidities and for patients over a BMI of 35 with comorbidities. Now, the NICE guidelines in the UK were updated in 2014 with regard to South Asians, because there are a lot of South Asians living in the UK. And it is believed that in South Asians, you can have um, comorbidities at a lower BMI. And therefore, it is recommended to offer surgery to those with a BMI of over 35, regardless of whether they have comorbidities or not. And of course, metabolic surgery can be performed for those who have a BMI of over 30 who have a type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, when we look at the bariatric procedures, they are um, uh, classified as restrictive and malabsorptive, although the malabsorptive procedures also have some degree of restriction of uh, intake of food. So the classic restrictive procedures are gastric balloons, gastric branding, and also sleeve gastrectomy. The original procedure that was described for this was a thing called VBG, vertical banded gastropexy, which is no longer done. Then, of course, we have the malabsorptive procedures like Roux and Y gastric bypass, mini gastric bypass, and also duodenal switch. So I thought I will focus this talk on the procedures that are available in Sri Lanka. So intragastric balloons, gastric banding, sleeve gastrectomies, and gastric bypasses. These are the procedures that are generally done in Sri Lanka. Now, when it comes to a gastric balloon, it's actually a good temporary procedure. Uh, it is day case and can be done under sedation. And uh, in this procedure, a 600 ml balloon is placed in the fundus of the stomach, which reduces the amount that the patient can eat. And this is approximately, this size of the balloon is approximately equal to two cans of uh, Coca-Cola. Now, It has been shown that with the gastric balloon, one can lose about 20 to 30 percent of the excess weight in about six months. But the balloons need to be re removed and replaced. And that can also be done endoscopically. Some patients complain of feeling sick and they also have vomiting, particularly earlier on after the procedure. So this is useful sometimes as a bridging procedure because sometimes the, when, the, when the patients are super obese, right, sometimes BMIs are even over 50, uh, this can be done as an initial procedure to get the weight down prior to doing a more definitive bariatric procedure. Then we have gastric banding, which basically consists of dividing the stomach into two parts using an adjustable gastric band and this is connected through a catheter to an access port which is placed under the skin. So you can, by injecting saline, you can tighten the band. So the, this is one procedure where it is adjustable, right? even the balloon is not adjustable but here it is adjustable, you can adjust the band to reach the goal. And it restricts the amount of food that the patient can take. And it also stimulates the nerves, telling the brain that the person is full. So at the time of doing the procedure, it is one of the safest procedures. It's a day case surgery. It's really uh, reversible. And you can achieve a 50 to 60 percent excessive weight loss. There are also no major nutritional problems and there is good evidence that it works in the long term. 
However, there are problems when you compare it with the other surgical procedures, this gives the least amount of excess weight loss. And it has less effect on the other medical problems like diabetes, hypertension and so on, uh, particularly diabetes. And it also takes some time to uh, get the best fill out of the band. One of the main problems why it has become unpopular is because you get band slippage and band erosions. And so although it is simple at the time of the procedure, you find that a lot of patients end up with complications and about 30% of them require further surgeries. Then we have Roux and Y gastric bypass. Here the a gastric pouch is uh, created by division of the stomach higher up and then you create a rule loop of jejunum to bypass about 150 centimeters of jejunum. And uh, it's a laparoscopic surgery, generally about two nights stay. And uh, in all these procedures, generally we give a liquid diet for two weeks followed by a blenderized diet for about another two weeks. This is because the patient has to get used to the smaller stomach. So this reduces the volume of the stomach to about 60 to 80 ml and thereby reduces the food intake and it separates most of the stomach from the food. One advantage of this procedure is that you get early control of diabetes because you get a rise in GL1 and GLP2 levels. Uh, and of the procedures, it is one of the procedures that is associated with a um, um, very high amount of weight loss. About 78 to 80% of the weight, of the excess weight is lost when you do this procedure. And for people who have uh, comorbidities, particularly those with uh, brittle diabetes, it's a good procedure. And it gives the highest cure rates for diabetic and the diabetes. And there is also long-term evidence because this procedure was earlier done by open technique. In fact, even when we started about, uh, about uh, more than 15 years ago, we used to do it by open technique, but now it is done laparoscopically. The problems are that it has more early complications than banding, although it's few. It's a longer operation. There is a rearrangement of the anatomy. There is a small risk of leak, but uh, the leakage risk is less than with sleeve gastrectomy, which we will talk about later. Uh, the patients require nutritional supplements lifelong, and they also require blood tests. So they need close follow-up. And also one problem, another problem that we encounter is that there is loss of endoscopic access to the distal stomach as well as to the duodenum. So if the patient develops an ulcer, right, we have no endoscopic access. So this is now the procedure that is probably most commonly done throughout the world, the sleeve gastrectomy. And it is our preferred procedure also for the majority of our patients. And here what happens is that a sleeve of the stomach is removed um, using uh, endoscopic stapler. So it is done laparoscopically. It takes less time than uh, a Roux and Y gastric bypass. And again, we follow the same routine uh, after surgery. Now, in all these patients, it is preferable that they lose weight prior to surgery. Uh, if they could lose about 5 to 10 kilos prior to surgery, it helps. It helps very much in the surgery also because many of these patients have fatty liver. And uh, using these fine uh, laparoscopic instruments, it's difficult for us to retract the liver. So therefore, we usually give a meal replacement uh, with Optifast for about two weeks prior to surgery. But you can achieve the same thing with a very low calorie diet. 
Now, sleep gastrectomy reduces the amount that the person can eat because the stomach is now reduced to about one-fifth of its, uh, its size. It also takes away hormones like ghrelin, the hunger hormones. The food also enters the small bowel a lot quicker. But the risk of dumping syndrome is less because we don't interfere with the pyloric mechanism. Uh, generally, good glycemic control occurs only after adequate weight reduction. Unlike in uh, the bypasses where you have an uh, increase in GLP-1 and 2 levels soon after surgery. This is not a reversible procedure. It's not like uh, gastric banding. And uh, there is a risk of weight gain later by stretching of the sleeve, particularly if the patient um, eats a lot. 15% of them don't lose the expected weight. Uh, the complication that we all fear is leak, though touch wood, we haven't experienced that yet. And also it's not a very good procedure if patients have significant gastroesophageal reflux disease because it can worsen heartburn after surgery. And unlike gastric bypass, it's a newer procedure, so you have only about 10-year data. Now, in general, when you look at these procedures, you find that after these procedures, right, you follow up patients for about three years, you find that there is a reduction in the insulin requirement and also the requirement of oral hypoglycemic drugs after surgery. So in general, you get 60 to 70 percent cure of hypertension, up to about 85 percent of cure of diabetes. It works very well for obstructive sleep apnea, about 90 percent get cured. And even GERD with the appropriate procedures, right, you find that they get cured. Like I said, sleeve is not a very good option if patients have, uh, uh, have GORD. The problem is with dyslipidemia. Only about 30% of patients get a cure of dyslipidemia and you get improvements in about 40%. So that is something that we tell the patients that their dyslipidemia may not improve after surgery. So following these procedures, there is an improvement of activity. Patients are able to exercise and they can get back to work and also get back to their hobbies. There are also other benefits. We know that obesity is associated with cancer and it actually reduces uh, the risk of malignancies, particularly breast cancer. There is also evidence to show that fertility uh, improves after bariatric procedures. Also, there are less maternal complications less risk of gestational diabetes and preeclampsia. And you also get slightly better neonatal outcomes like uh, premature, uh, premature delivery and low birth weight. Can these patients weigh, gain weight after surgery? They can. And there are many reasons why some patients gain weight some years after surgery. There are anatomical reasons because the gastric pouch or the sleeve can stretch. There are also physiological changes that occur like altered fat metabolism. There are also psychological problems in some of these patients which include depression and also some have adaptive difficulties particularly um, because they have to eat less. And also there are behavioral changes in some patients, lack of exercise. There are also problems with relate, relating to eating behaviors because some people take processed foods, some do what is called grazing, that is they eat all the time. I think the term grazing comes from cattle who eat most of the time. And uh, also some people eat beyond their satisfaction. So these are some of the problems and that is why we do a detailed psychiatric evaluation on all our patients and address any um, eating disorders preoperatively. 
So what is the role of the endocrinologist in obesity surgery? The endocrine disorders have to be identified and excluded. And it's not only diabetes, hypothyroidism, Cushing's, Kohn's syndrome, all these things should be identified and treated. And also we should achieve the best possible control of diabetes and other endocrine disorders like hypothyroidism prior to surgery. And also it is very important that these patients are followed up by the uh, endocrinologists right, for uh, future metabolic and endocrine problems. So don't worry, you won't lose your patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ishan Diswaisa, for that excellent lecture. Uh, we have, I think, time for a couple of questions, sir. Yes, any questions from the audience? Yes. Yes. The number of uh, whether you have risk factors or not, then you are eligible for free uh, gastric surgery. Yes. That is by NHS things. Yes. But uh, now in Sri Lanka, there are only few centers that perform the gastric surgery, but the benefit for, I mean, uh, the health benefits are huge, right. even though mo most of our patients come for cosmetic reasons. So can't we come to a like agreement that, that uh, those who have BMI above 40 yes. will be like automatically taken and then uh, given them the chance to... Yes. In uh, fact, we don't really have a problem because uh, anyone who comes to us or anyone who is referred to us, uh, we go ahead with surgery. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is that there is another set of surgical procedures now happening because now our patients whom we have done have lost weight. Some of them have massive weight loss. And now uh, uh, they are undergoing these what are called massive weight loss surgeries. Now, those are really not cosmetic surgeries. They are not considered cosmetic by the plastic surgeons. Uh, they are done by our plastic colleagues. In fact, Next Tuesday, one patient is uh, is undergoing uh, uh, these uh, uh, pro uh, several procedures. One thing that one problem that our patients complain is the upper arms. They find that the upper arms are are sagging, right? And uh, also this particular patient has sagging upper arms and significantly sagging breast. She can virtually sling them over her shoulders, right? And uh, and then of course uh, and then of course we have the uh, sagging abdomens uh, and uh, they need abdominoplasty. Some have sagging of the abdomens as well as the hips, so they have to undergo belt lipectomies, right? Because it has to be a circumferential. So those procedures are were considered earlier considered cosmetic, right? They were considered cosmetic. They were not offered free from the through the health system, but now. Uh, uh, around the world, the plastic surgeons believe that these massive weight loss surgeries are actually not cosmetic surgeries because these patients actually have a lot of difficulties as a result of this uh, excessive weight loss, right? Problems are mainly mechanical. So, uh, so I, I mean, there is no real problem uh, because uh, the bariatric surgeries are, we, we, and the metabolic surgeries we offer free. Uh, earlier, there was a problem with regard to these uh, surgery is following massive weight loss, but now that is also no longer a problem. The plastic surgeons are doing them uh, at the government hospitals. Ishan, uh, one question yes. from here, Udita yes. from here, yes. right? Yes. Uh, I think in relation to your question, uh, uh, Chaminda, yes. uh, like uh, I think NHSQ free of uh, uh, of offer for the people who are having more than 40. Yes. Now we all know that uh, the, the, the bariatric surgeries are like you know, huge metabolic outcomes and you know curing di actually diabetes, cure and everything together. But actually the, my question is Tishan now, almost all the insurance companies deny paying the insurance Correct. for bariatric surgery except one company which is an international company which pays because when you do it in the private sector it's almost a one million cost uh, and, uh, and huge health benefits. Uh, is there a way that we can actually uh, uh, make suggestions or something for the insurance companies to make payments for this condition? 
Yes, I think uh, it's something we should probably get together and do and also to explain to these people that it is not cosmetic. Now, in fact, even to the patients, I explain that it is not cosmetic. We are not doing cosmetic surgery. It, it, may, have a, uh, it may have a cosmetic effect, right? It may, the surgery may have a cosmetic benefit, but we are not definitely not doing it for, for cosmetic reasons. It is for the health benefits that we talked about. Because even those who don't have comorbidities are very likely to develop comorbidities in the future. And also um, have, you know, even young deaths as a result of these, uh, these comorbidities. So I think probably it's something that, you know, we should get together. The, the endocrinologists, the, uh, the other colleges, the Sri Lanka Medical Association, all these, uh, all these organizations. I think we should, uh, we should probably get together and uh, and try to work, uh, uh, work out this problem where you know the insurance because actually most of our work, about ninety percent of it is actually done at the at the national hospital. Um, but uh, because again, as you mentioned, uh, they don't uh, the insurance companies don't uh, don't cover this. But then there are many other things, you know, like say, for example, even things like pregnancy and all are not covered by by insurance companies because they consider it physiological and not a disease. You know, so so likewise. But uh, I think that is something. But uh, do they uh, in the Western countries do they cover? Does the insurance cover this? I'm not very sure. Because uh, now, I mean private now, insurance. Uh, bariatric surgery in the metabolic surgery has come up in the management of diabetes as well. Right. Therefore, they actually, uh, most of these insur international insurance companies are even covering in Sri Lanka. But uh, not the others, not the Indian insurance, but uh, what I'm saying is the Western insurance companies. Yes, I think that is something that, uh, that uh, we should uh, work towards because then there will be probably more patients coming in to get these, uh, get these procedures done. Uh, in the absence of any other questions, let me thank Professor Ishan Desoise again. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the last session. Thank you. So the College of uh, Endocrinologists would like to extend their appreciation by uh, issuing uh, some certificates. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Dr. Udita Bulughabit here to first hand over the certificate to Professor Ishan Desoise.